Hello, good afternoon. Welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Namaste. Happy Vadana, Kudzuzang Pula to all of you. Namaste. Good welcome hey. to everyone. Very happy to see you back. Some of you back, some of you new, great. Welcome to the second day of our workshop, which is organized by the World Future Council and iForm Organics International, and which is supported by the Deutsche Gesellschaft für Internationale Zusammenarbeit, GITS, GmbH, on behalf of the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, BMZ. Kindly note that this workshop is being recorded. My name is Ingrid Fitcher. I'm project manager for Scaling Up Agroecology at the World Future Council, and I'm delighted to be co-moderating this workshop on scaling up sustainable food systems through agroecology in the Himalayas with Gabo Figetsky, who is the head of global policy at iForms Organics International. We all know that we need to urgently transform our food systems to ensure our common future on this planet. However, far too often the most fundamental steps that we need to take towards that aim are not in the focus of our attention. Silo and piecemeal approaches still reign. Our workshop sessions of yesterday and today are all about the steps needed to scale up sustainable food systems through agroecology in the Himalayas. On this topic, we will be holding a series of stakeholder events in the coming months Today's sessions are part of the first stakeholder workshop kicking off this process. We plan to conclude this process by the end of this year with a common roadmap. Your expertise and experience have been and will be vital to this process. It will be needed to discuss and sharpen ideas to come up with and refine this plan that outlines the concrete steps of the much needed transformation that we have to pursue. Before I pass on the word to my dear fellow co-moderator, let me do some housekeeping. To reduce background noise, please keep yourself muted during the workshop unless you're speaking. We encourage you to switch on your cameras if your connection is allowing it. We only will switch off the cameras of those few participants who join late and who then automatically are in the spotlight of Zoom instead of the speaker. But please all feel free to switch on your cameras. Throughout the workshop, we will be able to contribute through polls and the chat function. If time allows, we will direct them all to our relevant speakers. During breakout sessions later today, we would love you to speak and discuss very actively. We will then encourage you to participate and use the raise your hand function. Over to you, Gabor. Gabor, you're muted. Thanks a lot, Ingrid. Also for the heads up. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. Namaste, Abhivadana, Kususang Pola. Um, it's a pleasure again uh, to be here with you. Um, most of you were actually present here uh, also yesterday as we just checked uh, the participants list and I really think that that was a, a very intense day of um, of really interesting presentations thoughtful discussions um, and very encouraging exchanges actually um, so yesterday we were focusing on exploring the main challenges and opportunities of sustainable food systems and agroecology while today we will explore the policy dimension, policies that support or hinder sustainable food systems and agroecology in the Himalayas, and come up with possibly a first set of recommendations on policy actions that are needed. Um, today, we will kick off with yesterday's poll results. So um, we will also give you a bit of a summary of what happened yesterday, but this is uh, coming in as as results of this uh, poll. Uh, this was focusing on 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 the one hand on the takeaways and also on feedback, what this process has in it for you, um, and some proposals from from for uh, improvement for for the uh, future process as well. So 
just to summarize this fairly briefly, I think uh, as regards on, on the basis of um, the answers that uh, that came in from you, and um, we would also like to thank you very much to those who who took the effort to to fill in uh, this little poll that we designed for the purpose. Um, so as regards takeaways, um, it was emphasized by many, many of many of you that an integrated, holistic, and mountain-specific approach is is really needed. Um, it was also emphasized um, that it's important to look at the interlinkages and also on the coordination and the collaboration among among the stakeholders, among the partners. And uh, with this work, we really need to target the policymakers. So this this also came out um, from the poll um, results. And many of you supported the idea of uh, coming up with a joint roadmap. Um, although this this big task looks to be the daunting, to, to be uh, daunting to to some of you. Um, it was also found that the situation across the region, so in the different uh, countries and states, uh, looks to be quite similar. Um, some of you have highlighted a few of the specific challenges we touched upon yesterday, such as climate change, migration, biodiversity loss, urbanization, the risk of losing uh, community knowledge and the living memory, and also on uh, opportunities, such as um, the importance of the region and the ecosystem services it provides to, to the plains uh, in Indi India, for example, or other countries. Uh, the integration of nutritious foods and income crops, local food baskets, consumer awareness creation on organic products, you name it. When it comes to the motives of people, why, why you want to be part of this process, uh, and also on the positive side of things, uh, the responses suggested a general satisfaction, I would say, um, with the way we proceed and um, as compared to the original expectations that you came in uh, to this workshop. And you mentioned the roadmap for the development of agroecology as a critical step for sustaining a harmonious way of life in the mountains, livelihoods of small and marginal women farmers and mountain communities and sustainable nutrition and calorie suff sufficient food systems. Um, some of the things you apparently see value in were experience sharing, innovation through cooperation, making contacts and getting ammunition for policy dialogues and sensitizing policymakers. Um, for others, the main motivation is related to participatory research, the strengthening of institutional mechanisms and empowerment of smallholders at the grassroots level. Um, and it seems that these issues are simply close to the heart for many of us. This also came from, from the responses. In your opinion, there is a lot of virtue in the positive attitude, inclusivity, cordial, open discussions, and engagement of participants, as well as the good timekeeping, uh, with which some of you disagreed. Um, lastly, your proposals for the way forward included more time for interactive discussions and sharing of successful case studies. Um, there was also a proposal to have physical meetings and more participants from the private sector, educated farmers, private and social entrepreneurs who deal with local realities on a daily basis. Also um, policymakers, so the government representatives at all three levels, central, state, and local were missing a little bit. So we, we also saw it at, in, in the poll yeah, uh, yesterday, in the initial poll that we only had under 10% uh, of policymakers. So we also identified this as a, as a weakness. Um, we should definitely improve uh, on that. And we really, so we can assure you that we have really done our best uh, to to get these people into the discussions, and many of them dedicated their time to to have an interview, a, a very lengthy interview with us. Um, but in the end, they could not join the workshop itself. And I would encourage all of you to join our task force, which we 
call now organizing committee, but we are very happy to turn it into a task force and help us get them even more engaged, the policymakers, or, or join or, or let them join. Uh, the group and please encourage people you know and send us contacts to stakeholders who you think should accompany us on this journey. Um, some of you were missing the results of our own assessment over the last few months. Um, we actually had an internal discussion on this and concluded that both highlighting the problems and finding solutions need to come from key stakeholders themselves in the region. So sharing our assessment would have been quite repetitive, I have to say, and therefore less time efficient. Nevertheless, the, the country reports that we are producing uh, will, of course, be made available as soon as they are finished. Um, but also to, to manage expectations, I, I don't think you need to, to expect huge surprises in, in, in those reports uh, after, the, after, after these two days that we are spending together. As regards the content, I think uh, their, their main value might be <clears throat> more in the structure, and also in the in the systemic uh, approach that that we are following um more impatient participants felt uh, we should come up with solutions instead of stating the problems and the good news is that this is exactly what today is actually going to be about in particular in the field of policies so with our first panel discussion we will be taking a deeper look at concrete measures governments can implement. Again, we will focus especially on Bhutan, India, and Nepal. And we will listen to Dr. Ravikant Avaste, former senior technical consultant, National Rainfed Area Authority, Ministry of Agriculture and Farmers Welfare, India. Kesang Chomo, Program Manager, National Organic Flagship Program, Department of Agriculture, Ministry of Agriculture and Forests from Bhutan. And then for Nepal, we will have Dr. Ram Krishna Shrestha, Chief of the Center of Crop Development and Agrobiodiversity Conservation, Department of Agriculture. We will then move into the breakout sessions at which we will be discussing your recommendations for policy action needed structured again like yesterday on the basis of the food systems approach. Thereafter, the session's rapporteurs will share their main deliberations of the session with everyone before we close the workshop with another poll and an outlook by the moderators. Thank you all distinguished speakers and participants for accepting our invitation and for making time to be with us today. We all wish to know what you think and what you feel. Please join the conversation in the chat of Zoom. We want to know your thoughts. Gabor, over to you. You're muted. Gabor? So after listening to, to your views and what, what your opinions were on the basis of uh, yesterday, um, now we can really turn to our policy experts who are actually eagerly waiting for their opportunity to, to give us an overview of policies supporting or hindering sustainable food systems um, and agroecology in the three focus countries in, in the Himalaya. So again, Bhutan, India, and Nepal. After the presentations, we will discuss the policy landscape in these three countries in a more comparative manner. During the debate, you are all very much invited to make comments and ask questions in the chat. Please indicate to which speaker you are directing your question to, and we will direct them later to speakers during the debate. And please share your thoughts with other participants. Okay, so we will kick off with Dr. Ravikant Avaste, former senior technical consultant of the National Rainfed Area Authority, Ministry of Agriculture and Farmers Welfare in India. Dr. Avaste, what is your assessment of your country's policies working for and against sustainable food systems and agroecology? What is, in your view, the way forward? The floor uh, is yours. Yeah, I have a, yeah, I'll. Mm 
Uh, is it visible? Hello? Yes, yes, I is can see. Is it yes, visible? Please. Yeah, it's a brief it's presentation. Visible and not even yeah. You can, um, did you already turn it into presentation mode? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great, wonderful. Good. Looks good, yeah. So, it's, it's, you get it? Yeah, yeah. Am I there? Am I there? Yeah, yeah, sure. We okay, see you okay. listening. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I have a brief presentation for a for a large country. Uh, we we had some kind of a sharing of views that uh, one should focus largely on what kind of uh, options are there, what kind of policies exist for sustainable food systems uh, at present in in the country. Uh, through my some kind of an exposure with the National Rainfall Area Authority and uh, to the ministries and etc. Uh, you know we have. Uh, uh, some kind of uh, an exposure, realizing that actually for the years that we have uh, interacted with most of these many state governments as well as central government uh, officials, uh, this you know, the governments largely support because uh, through my own personal interactions and as well as through the the available documents, uh, this the support is very much there. Uh, it varies whether uh, we have a uh, whether the policies are actually implemented in, in literal spirit. Uh, the organic farming policy was uh, launched, you know, drafted and launched way back in 2005. Uh, but it has not been, uh, you know, adopted in the, you know, extended or implemented in the sense it should have been. Uh, we, we look at it. Uh, but then uh, under um, that kind of a policy, taking it forward, a large number of schemes, you know, Initiatives, would you call it the central sponsored schemes in this country, in India? And we have a large number of them. So a couple of them I have mentioned here, which are directly related to uh, you know, promoting organic farming in one sense. Uh, you know, we have uh, the listed ones. So the one, two, three, four. And out of that, we have the first two is largely related to promoting organic farming. The next two are promoting, the fourth one is promoting both organic as well as natural farming. The third. Uh, the, the Indian natural farming system, it, it promotes, largely promotes the, uh, the natural farming in India. This year, last year's budget uh, has given a lot of money also. In fact, uh, more than almost 16,000 crores for the implementation of uh, various activities related to natural farming through the National Mission on Natural Farming. Uh, in fact, we, in, way back in 2003, the National Center for Organic Farming was created. And uh, the National Mission for Natural Farming also is being implemented and taking the, this particular National Center for uh, Organic Farming has now been renamed as National Center for Organic and Natural Farming. It's, state, it's situated and located in Ghaziabad, very, very near uh, the national capital in, in the state of Uttar Pradesh. And uh, they, are, they are taking it forward. They are you know, stewarding the entire movement of natural farming. And a and lot of many states, in fact, have given support to organic farming, whether it is the entire Northeast. In fact, almost all states of the, the Northeast are, are in one way or the other involved in promoting organic farming. Most of them have their own missions. Uh, the light from uh, uh, Jammu Kashmir, we have a lot of impetus on organic farming in, in Leh Ladakh, in fact, the Union Territory, recently created Union Territory. Uh, they had a we had a team at, uh, at Sikkim who vis visited us, and uh, there's a mission also going on there to convert that a particular area into a, an organic farming area, the uh, Indian territory. And right down from Leh Ladakh to all right down up to Tamil Nadu, you know, Kerala, Kerala has its own uh, organic mission. So, all these states, Karnataka is a very leading state in natural and organic farming, Maharashtra is extremely doing extremely well, Madhya Pradesh does extremely well. So all these states, as one way or the other, whether it is a, there's a policy or not, I'm not very sure because Sikkim is the only state which has created a, 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 a you know, Sikkim uh, created a, a, a you know uh, gave a, brought out a, a, an organic farming policy, and had a gazette notification on uh, you know streamlining the entire process with a lot of strict stipulations on do's and don'ts. So this is how it is, and uh, the state of affairs is good. There's a lot of support. Uh, the Honorable Prime Minister himself has been very vocal in, uh, you know, advocating reduction in the use of chemical fertilizers and chemicals in agriculture. 
So it comes from top up. So it's the top down approach that we are following. And the, the, the union budget also has given, provided a lot of funding for uh, the particular initiative of, you know, safe food production, in fact, largely, if I could say. And uh, post production and consumption also, we have a number of things are going on. We have a, a, perhaps one of the only countries in the world which has a, an act that, you know, it gives legal entitlement to people to have national say, right to food, in fact. In 2013, which was enacted in the in the Indian Parliament, the upper house and the lower house both have ratified this. And as a result, we have a lot of nutrition schemes that go on. Whether it is you know the infant the infant malnutrition is very high. As yesterday, uh, I think there was one presentation by uh, I don't remember his some Das who was presenting. A lot of uh, still a lot of hue and cry about the infant uh, or the age below five. The the malnutrition levels the uh, it's very high. Uh, in the Global 100 Index doesn't present a very rosy picture about Indian uh, uh, nutrition or hunger status in the country. Uh, but then we, once you have this global national food security, uh, you know, almost 80, almost 45 to 50 crore people are given free doles of food, uh, food grains, including pulses on a monthly basis. So there's a huge uh, ask for a country like India because we have a huge population to address. We have a midday meal scheme for children, and we have a targeted public distribution system under which 75% of the rural areas and 50% of urban areas are covered. So we have integrated child development services scheme where again, the, the um, mothers, uh, you know, ladies in family way are given a lot of care for new to address their, uh, uh, their um, calorie and nutrition security point of view. So this is the kind of thing. And then uh, to promote uh, exports and marketing, uh, you know, Agricultural Product Export Development Authority, Vida has been playing a, uh, a very, very important role, pivotal role, in fact, in uh, under Ministry of Commerce. Uh, they, they decide the on the basis of the Codex Elementaris and the IFOM guidelines. Uh, the, the the national program for organic production, the guidelines have been designed by them. They, they, they have they are the accrediting body for certification agencies along with. Tea board, rubber board, coffee board. No, there are a number of agencies that accredit bodies, accredit certifying bodies for undertaking third-party certification, and they do a lot of uh, help. The lot of help, lot of people in export. How do you do it? How does one export material? And then along with it, you have uh, because it's a, everybody understands it's a very costly affair for a small farmer to undertake third-party certification. So uh, India has taken a lead on on the, part, you know, the participatory guarantee system of India, PGS of India, uh, which again, the, the National Center for Organic Farming is stewarding. So they are the host body for uh, uh, taking forward the PGS in India. And of, apart from it, you have a number of initiatives recently lost in last 10 years, uh, whether it is for uh, uh, nutrition of uh, girls, adolescent girls or ladies. Uh, there were a lot of people are talking about, still a lot of nutrition work has to be done. So. Uh, we may have production, but we know that the nutrient density of the crops that are produced through uh, industrial agriculture is not very high. The nutrient density is low. The soils have, our Indian soils, uh, when we became independent, uh, we have uh, data from 1950 onwards. 1950, only nitrogen was deficient in the Indian soils. Now we have at least eight elements, including micronutrients are deficient in, deficiency has been widespread across the country. It's largely due to the, uh, you know, uh, it's not, I won't blame the entire, uh, put the entire blame on green revolution because it was largely wheat and rice revolution. It was not exactly a green revolution for all crops. Now we have a lot of missions on oil seeds. We have a mission on pulses. We had brew revolution. We had a white revolution, a yellow revolution on oil seeds. So we have different activities, different programs that are going on. So, And uh, the, the recommendations were actually very, very safe from the, from the researchers, from the academia. And but the farmers in one way or the other, I won't blame them also. It's the, the yield jump that we see when you apply chemical fertilizers drives the entire move, the movement of industrial agriculture. The moment, the overnight, uh, you know, the increase in increase in yields, uh, the, the production levels. So that drives the entire movement of industrial agriculture uh, because the response is high. But over the period of time, the response, the total factor productivity also has fallen very really rapidly. Now, earlier, you know, the, when the green revolution started, one kg of extra fertilizer applied, uh, external application of fertilizer would produce anywhere between 12 to 13 kgs of food grain, any kind of a grain. Now the response is between the one application of one kg of fertile chemical fertilizer, uh, you know, uh, produces anywhere between two to three kg per hectare. 
uh, it, it, it leads an increase of 2 to 3 kg per day. So that's the greatest, there's a big fall in the total factor productivity in that's been witnessed in this country. So uh, the one fact, one part that the, the farming community has dropped is uh, the initial recommendations when I started studying way back in 1977, and that the, the recommendation was to apply FYM, farmyard manure as a basal dose and then go in for top dressing to chemical fertilizers. Because it, the process of application of FIM as a basal dose is a cumbers cumbersome process. Uh, you know, it's not very convenient to use you know truckloads of uh, farmyard manure be dumped around and shoveled around. So that particular FIM has been eliminated was had got has got eliminated through the through from the uh, food production system, and we badly largely depend on the application of uh, chemical fertilizer right from the basal dose application. So that has resulted in rapid decline in the organic carbon status of the soils. You see, organic carbon status of the soils is it's very scary. Many place, many states have between 0 0.2, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and 0.3 percent of organic carbon in their soil. So that's not a very happy situation where you have, if there's no organic carbon in the soil, we call it as a, a dead soil because soil dynamism comes from organic carbon content. So that's uh, the entire dynamic process is being destroyed. So that's how it is. But then you have a number of schemes for food processing that have come in, marketing number of efforts have the present government has last in six, seven, eight years. You know, you know we are national electronic, we have the EM, ENAM national agriculture market, we have the Grameen the rural agriculture markets that have come in, and we have production like incentive system for food processing industries to be established. And we recently launched you know, two, two years ago, we have a formalization of food processing enterprising scheme through the you know, self-dependent Atman Nirbhar Bharat means self-dependent India. So under that particular uh, the initiative, uh, funds are available, schemes, the, the processes are being supported for uh, taking formal loans and getting uh, the, their uh, schemes approved. So this is the status of production post-consumption, uh, post-production consumption. If we, you know, largely if I see, uh, there are no direct policy measures or policies or measures that directly hinder uh, sustainable food product, food systems, except that agriculture subsidy is considerable in our country. And largely it's there in most of the countries of the world, I guess. And, um, uh, but then the, for a, for a developing country, for a resource constrained country like ours, we, it's a huge bill that we have to foot, footing the huge bill of 2.5 lakh to 3 lakh, 2.5, 3 to 2.5 lakh crores uh, that's expected in 22, 23. It's a substantial amount of money which could go into other developmental processes. So this is where the government wants to uh, bring in to uh, bring in the sustainable food systems. This is where we have a leeway, in fact, for our our kind of a program that we are in, we are initiating. You know, we are uh, contemplating because sustainable food systems will largely help in reduction of the food subsidy. You know, the fertilizer subsidy bill. Uh, we promote organic farming or natural farming. Regenerative organic farming, there are n number of them that are there now. So we we can have we have options. We can we need to discuss threadbare and then decide what how we take it forward. And GM crops recently, I don't know, they, they must have been some kind of because there is a huge you know bill of uh, import bill of uh, running into uh, billions of dollars. I am not able to give you the exact um, uh, the um, numbers of the food you know, edible oil import bill. I have the data, but it doesn't come to my mind. Um, it's a huge bill that we India is footing. So the, we, to reduce this uh, import bill, the pressure of, uh, of uh, you know edible oil import costs of cost, you know, uh, the government is perhaps trying to look into options of you know increasing the uh, the yields of mustard. Mustard is mustard oil is uh, largely consumed in our country or is one of the edible oils. So this is where this is the recent development that has happened. Just last year, November, December, this has, this initiative has been uh, taken. Uh, yesterday, I think Dr. Kavita was mentioning about uh, we, you know the the benefit of uh, benefit be benefit of uh, you know giving up uh, these chemical uh, fertilizers and getting the subsidy in in return as cash to the various states. It's a huge plus, in fact. In fact, you know the former chief minister of Sikkim. Every time he had been raising this issue that we have given up. In fact, Sikkim stopped lifting the fertilizer quota way back in 2004, 2005. And we got the Sikkim state of Sikkim got not a single penny in return. 
Now that the scheme has come, perhaps they can claim the backlog also. So, um, because we have not, you know, once you stop using, this is one very positive step of uh, the government of India, in fact, to encourage uh, sustainable food systems. This is another, another door opening for uh, sustainable food systems, where this can be an option taken to shown to the people, uh, to the policy makers, to the, uh, to the planners, to the bureaucrats, to the politicians. We know what to, a lot of homework to be done before we'd like to uh, take this forward because they need to be, they need to be a uh, lot of scientific evidence along with physical evidence, kind of success stories that I agree, a lot of success stories need to be brought forward. Sikkim is a huge success story. Uh, and then there are a number of other small st success stories that are spread across the country. So that also can be taken. Uh, and then there's one particular small market development assistant that I recently learned from one of my colleagues, ex, uh, one of my friends who's, who was earlier with uh, APIDA, that there's a market development assistance being given to, uh, to, to manage the, for the safe disposal of urban solid waste to build soil organic. It cannot be, go directly into our system of organic farming. Uh, you know, this uh, night soil or all that is not permitted. Any kind of processed night soil or urban waste is not permitted uh, as per the guidelines of. Uh, uh, the, uh, the APIDA guidelines or the NPOP guidelines or NOP guidelines to be put in, involved into uh, organic farming. But certainly they're given going for parks and gardens and city gardens, all kinds of things. Uh, there are a number of other areas where this you know, agroforestry, this can be put in uh, as built to build the soil organic carbon. This is a very positive step. In fact, some kind of financial assistance also is being given uh, 1,500 rupees per ton for scaling a production and city con consumption, city compost. It's a huge way. There's a colossal waste everywhere you find garbage being thrown around. If this can be converted into compost and you know plowed back into the soil somewhere, it increases soil organic carbon. Wherever it is, we are increasing soil organic carbon. So this is again a very positive step. Way forward, uh, I think we have discussed a lot uh, yesterday also. We have a Indian Himalayan region, it's a substantial area of almost uh, uh, 52.41419 million hectares. Uh, home to over 53 million people. And there are at least uh, 50, 500 million people who are settled in the plains, uh, who enjoy the benefits of ecosystem service, benefits of the, the mountain ecosystems. If you ask me yesterday, somebody was saying that, how do you uh, put a value to what the mountains give? I will, I'll give you in one state, I'll give one statement and it should suffice. The wealth of the plains is largely governed by the health of the mountains. So if we are unhealthy, the mountains are unhealthy, I don't expect this, the, the plains to be very wealthy. So that's how we, I see it as. And the Himalayas have been the water towers of the entire Indo-Gangetic you know, Indo plains, the football of India, whether it is, it starts right from Punjab, Haryana to West Bengal here, the entire Indo-Gangetic plains, the rice wheat built, white rice wheat belt as we call this, call it in India. So this is where the entire, all the rivers sustain from the Himalayas. So this is what we give to the entire place, to the entire country of India. And uh, the development issues of, are certainly very different from the mainland India. We need to bring it forward. We need to need, the people know it. The local politicians are very well aware of what we are talking about. And they'll certainly join us. If we approach them in the right way, we have a right approach. I'm sure all the 12 mountain states, the chief ministers will all join hands with us. I'm certain about it because they are all very concerned about the kind of policies that are that are dumped on the mountain states, developed at you know at, by the armchair bureaucrats at Delhi, and then just asked to be implemented in the mountains. Some of the schemes simply don't work at all. So, and some kind of hiding varieties will be thrown. All kinds of things happen. So, we need to educate. Uh, we need to, you know, a lot of convergence is required. If you ask me, uh, so that's why we need a very specific uh, policy for scaling sustainable food systems through agroecology in the Himalayas. We need a separate one for this. Uh, I have I've been saying that yesterday, I said yes, yesterday also, but to that we need to, uh, you know, one statement I have tried to put it, design and identify mountain and location specific agroecology technologies transform the Indian Himalayan region into agricultural driven robust economy by making farming an attractive economic development opportunity, especially to groom youth as agripreneurs. You know, money is required, please. Somebody yesterday was, Dr. Kavita was saying, Market is not very high. I tell you, if there is no money, we will not be able to take the sustainable food system. It's not, if we, is this, what we are propagating doesn't yield, doesn't bring money to the pockets. I tell you, it will collapse. The moment there's no, there are no economic returns from anything, 
calorie calorie security, nutrient security is on one side. We this this will be a, this is inbuilt into the uh, sustainable food systems, the calorie and food in the nutrition security. But monetary security, mon fiscal benefits, if it are not there, see the presently the middle aged elderly people are only involved in farming in the entire mountain ecosystems of India. And I'm sure it must be the same in Nepal and Bhutan also. The younger generations have all flown away. They all they fly away the moment they are crossing the school they they fly away to the mainland india find something to do their education and stay there if you go to the offices of delhi the ministries half of the the, the employees there the uh, the technical officers the academic the, the the clerical the assistants people all of them are from the uttarakhand himachal area 90% of them the, the uttarakhand is known for post office economy it was earlier known as now it is atm economy because money people and there are villages in and people in uh, villages in uh, in uttarakhand where the only elderly lady is living there so we need to bring in the youth if it, youth is if youth doesn't come back as as agripreneurs we are not going to see very much of this i'm not very not very negative about it but it's it's a very crucial component of what i'm trying to uh, communicate the youth has to be brought back to farming if youth doesn't come back to farming not only mountain ecosystem the entire indian agriculture system is going to take a beating in the years to come and then the finally the convergence to mobilize finance technology and capacity building skill development we need to converge we need to find, find finance for this yesterday also i told uh, dr ingrid there's a lot of money that's required without money we are not going to take it forward nothing will move forward i'm sorry to say i have a small proposed framework uh, we need an institutional mechanism to start with to to implement some kind of a, a, pro a proposed framework for how we take it forward uh, this is how i have uh, designed it it's open for dissection not discussion you can dissect it you can improve it you can do anything you like with it but this is how i feel this is a model that i have tried to uh, come up with uh, we need to find an implementation unit you'll have to have a model demonstration that we yes this works yesterday i think uh, uh, mr rajan kotru was saying we need to demonstrate it if we don't demonstrate this entire thing people will not accept and changing the farming practices overnight will not happen seeing is believing in extra agricultural extension if we, they don't see the the benefits of what we are trying to do monetary benefits nutrition benefits calorie benefits all in built only then this thing will entire thing will move forward and it's going to be a very challenging but very interesting kind of a of a of a program that we are trying to take it forward it's going to be very interesting in fact i can tell you we find a unit a landscape unit whatever it is spring sheds very crucial i can tell you there are six almost 6 million springs in the indian himalayan region and out of this more than 50% have dried up they are the lifeline for the mountain people unless we are trying to, unless we revive the spring sheds the people will suffer for water in the winters see it's a it's a situation of problem it's a problem of plenty and a problem of scanty in indian mountain systems plenty problem of plenty when you have the monsoon going around the moment the monsoon withdraws it's a problem of scanty people run around with buckets and uh, tubs of water for water looking for water so it's a very very you know it's a very serious kind of situation in the mountain ecosystems uh, we undertake the land resource inventory we have a house level, level baseline survey we need undertake a pra rural appraisal uh, undertake a need analysis a technology gap analysis implementation of appropriate um, technological intervention the interventions are given on the right side we can see two way uh, arrows have been given secondary agriculture and employment opportunities very important we got to harness the entire thing retain people there i i have i call it as a bio industrial watershed management you produce it and then you have the processing units value addition units take out some kind of product and market it lot dr vandana has been doing so uh, and mapping of ongoing lot of num number of schemes as i said huge number of schemes the government of india has been implementing uh, for last many years in, and then we need to converge we need to be uh, we, we converge all these existing schemes i think this is what i'll have got to say uh, for the secondary employment again the some small box has been given how we can do it we address all the hot post harvest management value addition marketing uh, non non farm livelihood also is very important there lady many people in a village uh, on a watershed or a spring shed uh, who don't have the own land so they also got to be kept employed somehow or the other uh, collective interventions collective enterprises also very important so these are the this is a 
Uh, we have coined a new term in the where I was there uh, in the National Rate Fed Authority. We call it, uh, along with integrated farming system, we call it integrated livelihood system. So we need to look into all kinds of options, all kinds of uh, things to uh, make the entire thing, uh, bring about a change in the entire uh, thought process, unless we have a change in thought process, I don't think uh, we'll succeed. Uh, not, but I'm very positive it can be done. We have, when I started organic farming, I didn't know what O of organic farming, but I'm there for the last 20 years. Thank you. Yes. Thank, Thank you for you. taking a lot of time. Thank you very much uh, for this very uh, comprehensive overview, which will definitely be good food for thought for our breakout sessions, I hope. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Aveste. Um, that I was agree. good. So let us, um, and also for the huge work which was behind probably. And um, let us now move to your neighboring country, to Nepal. And um, I hope Dr. Tresta is here, who is Chief of the Center for Crop Development and Agrobiodiversity Conservation of the Department of Agriculture of Nepal. Dr. Shrestha, ah, there you are, great, wonderful. So I hand over to you. He will share his views on the situation of Nepal's policies governing food systems and what he thinks would be good to move forward. The floor is yours. Uh, hello everyone. Um, good to see you all again. Uh, Ingrid, are you sure that it's my turn? Sure, yes. anyway. <laughs> because uh, in the agenda, I, I'm appearing there in the third place, no problem. So I'm, I'm ready uh, to share my okay. views. Um, Would you like to share okay. your presentation yeah. also? <clears throat> Great, okay, I see something coming up and um, it's not yet in presentation mode. There it is, great, <laughs> So we look much forward to you in your speech. Okay, so uh, thank you again. So I will uh, briefly highlight uh, uh, some policies uh, that work uh, in favor of uh, agroecology. And uh, like uh, uh, Awasti said, uh, we don't have uh, uh, per se the uh, negative uh, or hindering policies, uh, except uh, the fertilizer uh, policy one. I I'll be uh, talking about that as well. So um, I won't go into detail, but uh, we have a lot of constitutional provision, uh, which, uh, which is enshrined in various articles of the constitution that protects local citizen varieties and that uh, uh, protects consumer rights for safe food and also protects online for promotion of uh, uh, use of natural resources. Uh, and also we have a number of policies uh, that talk about uh, um, sustainable food system, agroecology, uh, uh, organic um, farming, uh, to name uh, a few. Um, agricultural policy, this is the first of its kind. Uh, it came into place in 2004. It has a provision of organic farming to be promoted, organic certification, then came agribusiness promotion policy uh, two years later. It talks about uh, special economic zones where special zones would be um, separated for, would be allotted for organic uh, production. Likewise, we have uh, uh, this flagship strategy, we call it uh, agricultural development strategy 2015-35. It has also a number of provision uh, in favor of uh, organic agriculture. Um, also, we have a uh, a lot of um, standards and operational guidelines uh, related to organic uh, farming uh, and um, its certification uh, systems, uh, biological and botanical pesticides and things like that. Uh, you can just have a look, I won't go into detail. Uh, likewise, we have a number of other related policies and policy measures. Uh, the green highlighted three, I will be talking uh, in big detail about uh, them. Organic uh, agriculture mission, promotion of indigenous crops and land races, and cattle set improvements. There are many others uh, which are in support of uh, uh, organic agriculture or agroecology. 
Likewise, we have a number of other initiatives and the small programs uh, at various scales uh, are being implemented by the federal government, uh, provincial government, and local government. And um, uh, we have uh, planned one agroecology conference that was in, flag, in fact uh, planned for February, uh, but uh, due to some technical reasons, we haven't been quite able to uh, you know, run this one, but uh, uh, we aim to uh, complete this uh, by June, July this year. Uh, then, uh, like I mentioned before, I'll be talking a little bit uh, in, in detail about this, uh, uh, the millets and other indigenous crops, uh, in short, MIC promotion program. This is uh, uh, one of the flagship programs uh, in support of uh, uh, agroecology. And uh, uh, we call it a, a potential vehicle for the rural transformation. Why we say so, there are a number of reasons. Uh, uh, this MIC uh, are the comparative advantages of Nepal, uh, Nepal being a, a mountain, mostly hilly and mountainous country and uh, they are oil uh, produced in those uh, regions. So uh, we have this comparative advantage of growing such crops uh, in hills and mountains. That's why where other commercial crops and basic staple uh, like uh, rice wheat uh, is less produced. Likewise, uh, once it was uh, such crops were the foundation of food and nutrition insecurity still uh, it serves uh, the you know important is an important is an important contribution to the food and nutrition security. We all know the health benefits of MIC. I don't need to um, explain more. Uh, in, in, in recent years, like I mentioned yesterday, uh, malnutrition problem is uh, also uh, there, uh, and also NCD is growing. So uh, with this MIC, health benefits people can reap the benefits of MIC. Likewise. Why we should say a rural transformation? Also because uh, it creates rural entrepreneurship and employment. And uh, it's also a vehicle for women empowerment. We all know MICs are climate resilient crops. And also it provides, it helps in ecosystem, providing ecosystem services and ecosystem uh, you know, um, regulation, uh, different kind of ecosystem services uh, uh, being provided by the uh, MIC crops. And also it supports to our individuals to agriculture. So that's why we call it uh, a potential vehicle for the transformation of uh, Nepal. So just to give you a brief highlight about the program, it is centrally sponsored program. It was started in 2018-19. The whole activities focus on whole uh, entire value chains. All seven provinces are covered with this uh, centrally sponsored program. Uh, in particular, this uh, financial year, 133 local levels are being covered, and the fiscal transfer of uh, 280 million Nepalese rupees has been made uh, for the implementation of this program. So there are basically five uh, strategies of promotion of this uh, uh, MIC crops. One is awareness and sensitization. What we have seen over the years is still uh, many, uh, you know, uh, grassroots people and then uh, even general consumers are not aware of the health benefits uh, and uh, economic benefits of uh, MICs. Not only that, our political leaders and political representatives, they are less aware of the importance of uh, these MICs. And in many cases, social taboos are attached to these MICs. So we thought it's uh, very necessary uh, to build awareness about and sensitize the people about this MIC. So this is a uh, first uh, component. Second, technology and uh, production support. Uh, once people are aware and uh, we, we help them uh, in, uh, in raising production. So we provide all the technological and production supports uh, like seed supports and uh, uh, technology support, soil uh, health improvement support, small machinery support, and uh, capacity building support, so many supports uh, uh, is being provided, are being provided through this uh, scheme. And third one for us, uh, this is uh, uh, the most important of all five uh, strategies. 
uh, it's called product diversification of food recipe, uh, you know, uh, food recipe development and value addition. Uh, it's a critical because uh, 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 it can create a forward and backward linkage. Uh, what we have seen is uh, we have uh, only a handful of uh, recipe, food recipe, uh, based on this uh, MICs. Uh, so especially children and youngsters won't like uh, those recipes. So if we could uh, introduce uh, modern recipes, uh, also uh, having a longer shelf life, then uh, we can create demand and then uh, that will translate into uh, the you know, increased production uh, and also uh, to the forward side, to create a entrepreneurship development and uh, market uh, access uh, will be enhanced. So this is uh, uh, the most important one strategy among the three of uh, five ones. And not only a product diversification, value addition and food recipe development is sufficient. We need to create a business case. So unless uh, we create a business case and help our uh, youth and in rural women stay uh, in a rural area and uh, engage uh, in the business, uh, they won't uh, create any uh, you know, you know, big impact. So entrepreneurship development and marketing support is the fourth component where we provide uh, some cap uh, capital uh, subsidies and capacity building support and to open up um, you know, a retail outlet uh, and also uh, um, uh, for the um, accessing distant market, this kind of supports are available uh, within this uh, uh, fourth component. And fifth one, uh, conservation, of course, uh, uh, it's uh, uh, again, the very important one, uh, unless you conserve uh, land races and uh, local crops, uh, you won't be able you know, uh, to do what um, these MICs are meant to contribute to. That's why uh, we, for, for this conservation um, task, uh, we basically focus on, uh, you know, um, what we call community seed bank. We promote community seed bank and we provide technical and other supports uh, for the conservation activities. So here are some of the examples. I <clears throat> won't go into detail, but these are some of the uh, examples of awareness and sensitization. And, uh, these are again uh, flyer and small booklets are uh, being produced and shared with the farmers and other stakeholders. And this is technology support uh, examples, a large production blocks of uh, commonly produced uh, millets and other pseudo cereals. And this is a uh, product diversification and valuation supports. and need to conserve uh, the MICs. Uh, and we focus uh, on <coughs> promotion and support of community seed bank and in situ and ex situ conservation. We have provision of in situ and ex situ conservation, uh, seed exchange program and uh, conserving the national seed bank. And we also promote uh, uh, exchange of local seeds and local land races. And also we help farmers and communities uh, in registration of local land races at the national uh, seed board. Uh, by doing so, uh, they will be able uh, to do seed business of cropland races. Uh, so this is just an example of how we are conserving uh, the local technology, business technologies and engineers um, uh, land races, cropland races. <clears throat> uh, and then uh, this is, a, I think, a very important one. Uh, in recent um, you know, years, we have uh, introduced uh, this uh, kind of policy um, initiatives. Uh, um, we have asked local levels where uh, this program is being run uh, to include uh, the millets and indigenous crops in the midday meals. And because uh, in our case as well, up to grade six, there is a, a midday meal provision. And if we could introduce uh, millets and indigenous crops, best food recipe in the midday meals, then uh, the learning and teaching environment uh, will be better. Not only that, uh, it will help in, in curbing the malnutrition that we've been suffering from. 
our kids are suffering from. Also, uh, military news crop based snacks in public gathering and meetings. Uh, this is a kind of campaign. So government agencies should uh, consume millet and indigenous crop best snacks uh, in their public gathering and meetings. If they do so, then it will again create the demand for the product and then forward and backward linkages will be uh, created and enhanced. Also, we've been focusing on school curricula on MIC and food recipe. We have requested uh, schools because there is a provision of local curriculum, they can easily include MIC's uh, production and food recipe in their local curriculum. Likewise, we have introduced this uh, direct benefit, uh, direct cash transfer for MIC uh, you know, growing. Uh, what we do uh, in this particular scheme, uh, per hectare 18,000 uh, Nepalese rupees uh, uh, is provided for utilizing barren land and cultivating uh, MICs. Likewise, when they produce, if they sell to the designated, uh, you know, authority designated uh, uh, market outlet, then they are liable, uh, they are entitled to get uh, uh, Nepalese rupees 10 uh, per kilo of their output. Also, we've been, uh, you know, um, advocating, uh, uh, we have a, a public distribution system, uh, we have a public distribution agency called uh, FMTC, Food Management and Trading uh, Company, uh, under the uh, government uh, ministry of uh, commerce and supplies uh, so we've been advocating that uh, help us in purchasing our farmers uh, mic's uh, production and uh, utilize in public distribution uh, system uh, but some uh, some local levels local governments are uh, they have already started purchasing mic yet uh, msp they have announced msp and they purchase uh, MICs. So these are some of the examples. The midday meal, this is a midday meal, uh, uh, some photographs, and this is the uh, MSP purchase uh, certificate given to uh, S uh, one cooperatives. Then second, we have this organic uh, promotion mission. Uh, uh, it was started in 2018-19 with the two provinces. Uh, it, it consists of two components, millets and indigenous crops, like we just discussed, and also organic vegetables. So what we aimed through this program is just give a market outlet, market vent to uh, by default uh, organic uh, millets and indigenous crops, and also in city centers and urban areas, focus on organic vegetable production and marketing. So two components, and uh, it also focused on the whole value chain. Uh, it ran uh, from uh, from the center only one year, and then we transformed to the uh, federal system, and now it's it's been handed over uh, to um, <clears throat> provincial government, and uh, central government annually provides a conditional grant to run this program. And uh, now, uh, in the uh, like uh, the follow is a follow up program. We have now this organic production promotion program. It's also centrally sponsored program. Uh, uh, like I mentioned, it's also uh, uh, as well organic mission converts uh, into this. Uh, it contains uh, um, OA awareness, capacity building, farmer support and initiative related uh, activities. And there is also provision of uh, setting up a model organic farm. And there are other activities, including soil health and fertility improvement, branding of organic agriculture products. Uh, and also uh, we annually provide a conditional grant uh, to run this program. In fact, this is the uh, you know, convergence follow-up program of uh, the uh, organic mission. Another one is a cattle set improvement and manure management program, which is also a centrally sponsored program. Uh, this is separate, in it is a separate program standalone program. At the same time, there are several other centrally sponsored program which have the component of cattle seed improvement and manure management. So it aims to improve the soil health and reduce dependency on fertilizers. It also has a provision of botanical pesticide promotion and the preparation and a lot of support mechanism within it. So regarding hindering policies, like I mentioned before, we don't have a, per se the hindering policy, but uh, the fertilizer subsidy policy we have. And uh, uh, if you uh, see, uh, 
In the last seven years, the subsidy amount has increased by 717%. And uh, in this current fiscal year, the subsidy amount is um, 38.5 billion Nepalese rupees, which used to be around uh, less than 5 billion uh, Nepalese rupees some uh, six years ago. So there's huge uh, uh, increase in, in fertilizer subsidy. And for, for us, uh, for a small economy uh, like we are having, uh, it's simply unsustainable. So, but having said that, it's a kind of political commodity in Nepal. I guess uh, it applies to uh, um, um, India and Bhutan as well to some extent. And uh, uh, you see uh, more than 40% of total, the Ministry, MOL, Ministry of Agriculture and Livestock Development, total ministry budget, more than 50% goes to fertilizer subsidy. And, uh, you know, in, in recent years, uh, there has been a growing um, trend that uh, people judge the sitting government on the basis of uh, to what extent they have been able uh, to, to timely supply the fertilizers. So the government focus all the time on timely supply of fertilizers, but even often they fail to do so. And on an average, there is a 70% subsidy on urea, DAP, and uh, diamond phosphate and uh, milled of potash, you know, three major fertilizers. And government has recently made uh, uh, another decision curbing uh, the um, you know, uh, subsidy percentage uh, to bring it down to 60%. And uh, there are a uh, number of you know, debates going on in for and against uh, this decision. And political parties, obviously, they are against this uh, you know, um, uh, reduction in fertilizer subsidy. And, uh, but, but, but for the government, it, it's a sandwich between two extremes. Two extremes, I mean, is uh, there is a one group uh, which believe in, there should not be any you know, chemical fertilizer this, right away. The uh, government should stop. Uh, you know, importing and uh, distributing fertilizers. That's uh, one group. Another group says, oh, completely, you know, uh, you know uh, organic, uh, organic uh, farming is not possible. So we can't go to uh, organic farming. So we should go for chemical agriculture and uh, look for uh, ensuring food security first. So there are two extremes there and then government is always sandwiched between two extremes. But uh, you know, negative impact of fertilizer, its affordability, sustainability, uh, and alternative, alternative means of nutrient supply are hardly discussed uh, in, a, in a public debate and uh, in, in a policy debate as well. So way forward, uh, I will go uh, briefly. So awareness and sensitization uh, is the key uh, based on so negative impact of chemical fertilizer and positive aspect, uh, aspects of uh, agroecology and organic agriculture uh, need to be uh, you know, understood uh, by all the uh, actors and stakeholders and general farmers and consumers. So awareness sensitization is the key. And also uh, we need to mainstream the national pathways decided through UN Food Systems Summit, like I mentioned yesterday, uh, among the many uh, you know, national pathways, the natural positive uh, farming, adopting natural positive farming system uh, was the main, and it should be mainstream. And uh, sadly enough, program. So it should be the case. Uh, again, uh, promotion of organic manure production is household level. We promote organic fertilizer production, but uh, uh, the organic manure production at Uh, uh, you know, schemes like I mentioned before, but we have to focus it a bit more uh, to help, uh, you know, expand the um, um, production, uh, organic agriculture production and agroecology. And also uh, incentive mechanism, we, you know, uh, billions of rupees uh, are being spent uh, in purchasing and supplying um, chemical fertilizers. Uh, we have some uh, uh, organic fertilizer uh, subsidy schemes, but they are quite negligible if you compare with that of uh, chemical fertilizers. So we need to enhance uh, the uh, you know, support and subsidies who want to adopt a, uh, uh, organic agriculture and agroecology. And also 
we need to now discuss on, uh, on a plan for the gradual phasing out of fertilizer subsidy. It's not uh, sustainable from both the perspective, from the uh, financial viability perspective, and also from the uh, you know, environmental sustainability perspective. So uh, the sad uh, thing is that no one, no one uh, you know, uh, politician uh, wants to talk to uh, you know, phasing out fertilizer subsidy. Like I mentioned, it's a kind of political community here. So, but we need, we are desperately needing a big debate on whether we should be going for phasing out of fertilizer subsidy. And again, um, uh, when we talk about organic uh, agriculture and agroecology, in the, at, least, at least in a transition phase, we need to think seriously about the production inputs, be it uh, a nutrient supplement or be it uh, uh, alternative means of uh, design pest management. We are largely you know, failed to provide uh, this kind of alternative to the farmers. That's one of the main reasons why we have been not that able to expand the area under organic agriculture. Also, now we need, like I mentioned yesterday as well, we need now national framework for the transition to agriculture. We don't have as yet that. And also, uh, it, it applies to donor uh, fraternity that uh, they should come forward and uh, uh, engage so with the government for loving you know, agroecology and organic agriculture. Because we have seen over the years, when you, you talk to our government, they tend to listen to you. And when we talk to them, they, they don't pay it heed. That's the reality. So uh, here comes the important role of our donors and development partners. And also what I think is a, a landscape approach uh, should be adopted and joining for agroecology uh, should be done when we embark on that uh, direction. And also for that, we need maybe, maybe we need, we are in need of bigger scale pilot project, uh, you know, to implement agroecology. And uh, mixed farming system or integrated farming system uh, uh, is uh, traditionally um, you know, um, in, in practice in Nepal, especially in hills and mountains. So we need sustainable intensification of mixed farming systems. Simit and others, they are working in this area. So that should be promoted and supported. And also uh, various international platforms, like I mentioned yesterday, um, that IFOM uh, Organic and also uh, um, Agroecology uh, uh, Coalition, Ishimur, and various other platforms uh, should also be utilized. And for all this, you know, it's easier said than done, but political will and commitment is the key. Unless we have this, you know, unless uh, we, we are not sure of uh, garnering support from our political leaders, nothing uh, will gonna change. So finally, take home message, a possible roadmap to a scaling in the analyzed roadmap. I want the Ingrid and others um, it, it could be, uh, you know, in, in today's discussion, or it could be when you go for, you know, devising or designing these roadmaps. Uh, this could be a possible roadmap for the A scaling roadmap uh, in Himalayas. So what I think is uh, we need still, there, is, there are confusions among the stakeholders, among the practitioners even. So we need some kind of clarification in the concept and pathways, you know, what is, organic agriculture, what is agroecology, what are other related concepts, and what our common pathways uh, to agroecology. So that's one very important, uh, I think, uh, uh, area that uh, we should be looking at. Again, uh, we need to develop a model or pathways for agroecological transition. It could be different for three of us, but uh, we need to have uh, this one. And again, uh, more research and evidence generation is necessary, especially for supplying organic inputs and resources during this transition process. And also uh, we might have you know, uh, various examples of uh, best practices here and there, scattered here and there uh, in, in, in three countries. So we need to look at them. We need to develop them as a knowledge product and we need to share them and uh, need to build the capacity of actors and uh, practitioners and stakeholders based on that 
uh, good practices, best practices. So again, uh, need to engage with the government multiple times. I'm saying this, it applies to uh, institutions like iPhone. So you need to engage more with the governments. Only a only, uh, couple of digits may not be sufficient. So more we engage, the more we'll be able to make them understand the importance of agroecology. So to this direction, Ishimod or IPOM or any other relevant institution, they take the lead. Uh, so here, uh, this is, uh, yesterday I didn't talk about this. We are celebrating this uh, International Year of Millets. And this is a very simple, simple recipe based on locally produced um, MICs. So this is amaranth, this is a buckwheat, this is a finger millets, local, local tomatoes, pickle, and this is local uh, beans and local potatoes. And this is what you call that um, foxtail millet uh, pudding. Uh, so this uh, there's been a kind of, you know, uh, what we call that uh, brand, a brand, a local uh, recipe brand uh, in some of, uh, you know, hilly districts of uh, Nepal, Western hills of Nepal. Uh, so it's gaining popularity and we are trying to, uh, you know, uh, make it a, a general uh, food recipe in a public gathering. Uh, thank you very much. We thank you very much, uh, Dr. Strasta, um, for for the yeah um, very exhaustive um, description of uh, of uh, what the situation in terms of policies in in your country uh, is. Um, and what we can assure you about is that this political will and political commitment that you highlighted so much. Uh, this is exactly what what we have in mind. Uh, to to create and to get um, through through this work, and this is why we we are designing the the roadmap. And yeah, it's it's great that um, we align so much on this. Um, we would like to turn to our next speaker, to to Gesang Chomo, but unfortunately, it seems that uh, she has uh, internet connection uh, problems. Uh, so in the meanwhile, I would then. Uh, Take a look at uh, the very lively discussions that are going on in the, in the comments in the in the chat box. Uh, maybe Vlad, uh, you could bring in uh, some of the. Uh, in Thank you. Thank you, Gabor. Yes, indeed, we have a lot of comments and a lot of questions to our speakers, and I kindly ask our speakers to 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 stay on the stage. Uh, so one of the um, important question was addressed to. Uh, Dr. Avache, uh, about the difference between organic agriculture and natural farming. So it was partially addressed, but might be you can add something. So how the government sees the difference in India? The government, the, the government doesn't see the difference. The difference is in package of practices that are adopted. So whereas, you know, while uh, organic farming has very strict guidelines, strict package of practices, number of options, do's and don'ts, uh, evidence-based uh, research-based uh, evidence, you know, research-based evidence, you know, has, is available. Uh, what kind of practices are read, and periodically everything is reviewed. Uh, we have a body of IFOM. We have a uh, number of other agencies. We have the FAOs, Codex Alimentarius, and then we have each country has its own guidelines, you know, to develop uh, to you know to further the cause of organic farming. Uh, whereas natural farming is a concept that has been it's been there in the country in India for quite some time, but uh, you know we uh, we are still uh, understanding the principles. How do we go about it? A lot of people are practicing it. It is beneficial. There are a lot of evidences available now. Uh, the the components are different. Uh, it's basically uh, you know treating the seeds, uh, treating the soil, encouraging the microbial diversity in these soils encouraging uh, intercropping, uh, mulching, and uh, trying to trap the water that's available in the atmosphere. Uh, these are the basic principles of, uh, uh, you know, the uh, natural farming. Mm -hmm. And a uh, lot of success is being seen in Andhra Pradesh. Uh, particularly, they have their own uh, mission there for natural farming. They're building extremely well. Uh, a lot of farmers, uh, millions of farmers have got involved in natural farming. A lot of success has been seen. 
uh, uh, and the uh, Indian Council of Agriculture Research also has initiated research in natural farming for last three, six, three and a half, four years now. Uh, so it's it's a uh, the research is ongoing, but the basic principles are there for people to follow. Karnataka has been doing extremely well in uh, natural farming. Uh, and Himachal Pradesh has been doing extremely well in natural farming. I don't know the status now oh, after the change of government there. Uh, Dr. Chandel, who took over the vice chancellor at Solon, a uh, big proponent of natural farming. So, mm -hmm. A lot of options available. It's good. Uh, it depends on an individual's preference. One individual's choice is a choice that decides what one wants to do. Uh, the, the, uh, it's very cost effective. In fact, natural farming, uh, Agni has, the, the plant protection options also are naturally made. So number of options, and it's very cost effective. The, the entire purpose is to reduce the cost of production and, and increase the soil diversity, uh, increase the root depth so that the, so the soils are explored by the uh, roots uh, to exploit the soil nutrient content. The varying views on it. Some people say it works, some people say it doesn't work. And there are no, st no strict guidelines, if you can say, uh, like organic farming has strict guidelines, NPOP guidelines are available for India. Like mm -hmm. that, uh, and uh, and the, the guidelines are being prepared by the national mission. There's a committee com constituted under the National Mission on Natural Farming, uh, the National Center for Organic and Natural Farming, Ghaziabad is steering it. So uh, the guidelines are being prepared now. So mm -hmm. once you have the guidelines, it, things will become more clear uh, because mm -hmm. we I have interacted with over 100 natural farming farmers. Each one has his own, uh, they tweak, they tweak their, uh, according to what sources are available. Some people mm -hmm. use cow dung, some people use vermi compost, some people don't use anything, some people use uh, the principles that I stated earlier of uh, you know, using jaggery, corn flour, and all kinds of stuff. Uh, for use weeding, uh, weed mulching, uh, intercropping, uh, some use uh, the preparations out of uh, one cow. They say one cow is more than enough for three hectares. Some people have three cows. Some people have thirty cows. So these variations are there. Okay. So it's people okay, great. Um, are things Dr. Avasti, okay, great. Thank you. I mean, um, we have quite a number of questions as far as I have seen. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> and um, well, if Kezang is back, and then we would love also to still have your views on the comparative side of things. So let's. Um, if possible, if it's okay with everyone, we will not, let's say, um, go too much into detail now. Let's perhaps discuss um, particular questions and that go a little bit more into detail in the breakout sessions, if possible. Okay. Uh, um, there is a question to um, uh, Dr. Shresta about um, this policy MIC that you mentioned. How do you assess its effectiveness and how many farmers uh, had an access to it? Uh, so how do you judge the implementation of this policy? Uh, well, a uh, very good question. Uh, in fact, um, it's been uh, three years now. Uh, we are running on fourth year this year. Um, and uh, we work uh, in collaboration with the provincial and uh, local level governments. Uh, we are having a uh, you know, mixed kind of, uh, you know, experiences uh, in, in uh, implementation of the MIC's promotion program, in the sense that uh, we provide uh, operational guidelines uh, how to go for that, and then we do some kind of uh, capacity building support. On top of that, uh, we provide a conditional grant for the implementation. Uh, so we have a very little. Uh, so to say very little um, control over how things are going on in the grassroots because they are different governments. So we engage them in our conversations. So we do uh, physical and virtual uh, interaction and meetings, how things are going. But even then uh, we find uh, sometimes uh, they are not you know, being uh, implemented in a proper way that we, uh, you know, uh, plan, we, we originally planned to. But having said that, there are uh, isolated cases of uh, good practices coming up, like I mentioned some of them. So uh, it's a kind of mixed uh, uh, experiences, but uh, it has helped in gaining momentum towards the uh, uh, millets and indigenous crops. 
So local level grassroots people, the, I, I saw some of the questions uh, pertinent to that, that point as well. So local people, uh, what we do is we, uh, we implement the production in a block. So farmers are grouped in a block. The block farmers, uh, they are entitled to receive all the supports that I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. And also there are provision of marketing support as well. So yeah. But, but we are here very, uh, very much hopeful, uh, you know, uh, uh, for days ahead uh, to, to further improvement in this program. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, there is a multi-billion question uh, that I think we will address it in the very end of the project. How can mountain farmers best support it in accessing uh, markets, inputs, and services? So we, we are talking about the overall uh, action plan for the region that might be uh, it is it will be hard to answer at this stage yeah there are also very interesting comments about of course empowerment of women and uh, gender equality that uh, uh, some participant thinks that uh, this is not addressed in organic farming for instance also there are comments about importance uh, negative effects, not importance, but negative effects about of uh, liberalization and privatization of agricultural inputs. This is hindering the development of uh, sustainable food systems in the government. Also, there are uh, a lot of um, yeah, comments, of course, on natural farming that have been said already. And also one important question, uh, comment about the implementation of policy. So there, as usual, policies are there, but our participants see that awareness about these policies are low, is low, and also the, um, the stuff that is implementing, the, uh, the public stuff that is responsible for the implementation of policies on the ground is also not there. So this is important to build the capacity of government and also to increase the awareness. And also important uh, a comment about that we have to build a communication campaign around natural farming and organic farming uh, to build uh, capacity of stakeholders and the awareness on this. There are many, many other questions in the chat, and I kindly ask uh, our speakers to answer these questions in the chat because we will not be able to answer all of them live uh, unless uh, our speaker is still not here. Uh, no, so. So um, Vlad, thanks. I mean, um, let's first perhaps go uh, with the question on the comparative situation and then let's um, use uh, the time left um, with uh, comments and questions that you further have detected. Perhaps um, that is um, a way we can best uh, use the time and be on time in the end, perhaps for the breakout sessions. Um, if possible, then I will take over and give the word back to you. Um, this is the end of the session. Thank you so much for sharing already a first set of comments and questions, which are very, very interesting. Great. So um, unfortunately, our third speaker from Bhutan is having internet connection problems, um, and he's not able to come back. Um, so um, Dr. Avaste, Dr. Shrestha, we will proceed with you. and have um, a bilateral comparative um, on India and Nepal. So um, please, um, now we would love to look a little bit more um, on the policy situation in a more comparative manner. You've heard uh, what your neighbors are doing and uh, the considerations, reflections here on. Um, Dr. Avaste, I would like to ask you first, how does India's policy situation compare with your neighbors. Please also include Bhutan if, if you wish. And please, if possible, highlight three peculiarities and three similarities perhaps of your country's policy situation compared to Bhutan and Nepal. Tell us a little bit more about these, please. Thanks. The policy in India has been in existence for almost two decades now. Uh, but uh, for, uh, you know, the implementation hasn't been uh, that effective or hasn't been at the desired level, if I would say so. Uh, because um, 
initially there was some kind of a support for organic farming you know last two three years the the directions changed towards natural farming um, and uh, there's a competition now between a uh, natural farming and organic farming rather than you know competing against industrial farming uh, there's a group there's a lobby trying to put down organic farming claiming that it is more harmful than natural farming i don't understand the entire logic maybe somebody has some reason for that uh, but at very high level people have been influencing the decisions at the at this at the, at the federal government level the central government level uh, that's how the entire uh, funding process also for uh, organic promoting organic farming has somehow taken a beating uh, there are, there is no direct funding for organic farming but there are components within different schemes like rashtra krishi vikas yojana and the paramparakat krishi vikas yojana no uh and uh, you know mission value chain organic development for northeastern region mission integration then mission integrated development for horticulture there are components within these schemes where organic farming can be undertaken and promoted in clusters initially from up to 2015 uh, up to 2016 17 uh, the, there was a huge impetus money was clusters we were being developed in organic farming a demonstration clusters of 50 acres farmers were you know funding was given for farmers to come into you know develop clusters and all that now this entire thing has been shifted over to natural farming but the government decides its own priorities but uh, uh, there is scope for both if i if somebody ask if anyone asks me uh, natural farming definitely ha- has its own benefits very cost effective farmers have been benefiting from it a uh, lot of farmers have in andhra pradesh karnataka andhra and um, uh, and himachal pradesh have shown the way they have benefited but there is uh, that is also a sustainable form of food system production and organic farming definitely it's a very established kind of a mechanism where uh, sustainable food production systems are uh, there to be seen we have seen it we have i have done it myself so i don't need anybody's certification for that so i have because i know how it works how effectively we have been able to do it whether it is disease control or the pest control maintaining uh, uh you can if i can say when i was there almost two years ago almost two years now since i stopped being a regular researcher but my interest is still there we maintained a diversity of 16 to 17 sometimes 16 to 18 crops at a given time in our farm of 25 acres so that itself is a huge hindrance for disease insect pest incidents uh, and uh, the adjoining the entire ecosystem was beautiful we had on farm diversity and the off farm diversity as well uh, natural predators natural pests uh, control um, biological agents uh, you know it was all working in tandem with environment with the nature uh, people from various parts of the country and with some people from different countries also visited and they were surprised to see absence of diseases and insects in our farm so it it is not that it is not possible diversity maintaining diversity is perhaps the most crucial aspect of whether it is natural farming whether it is uh, organic farming on farm uh, diversity crop diversity is is very crucial maintaining a healthy livestock population very crucial production of uh, on farm resources of nutrition and pest insect pest control very crucial we could generate almost 80 to 85% of nutrient requirements on farm so this is a huge saving we didn't have to depend on external sources for i, I never purchased any any kind of a nutrition source in the 8 years there was there as the head of the institute there not a single truck of material had come from outside so it is not that we maintained a healthy cow population milking cow population we had a poultry with us we have a piggery with us we had a goat unit with us so it's easily possible to do things it's not and we have done it in the entire state has done it it's not that the infrastructure that the, the nepal government is creating is very good in fact if the livestock production is there you know we need vermi composting units you need uh, cow urine pits you need uh, rural composting units so all these things the, the state government the national government of nepal is doing is extremely welcome i think in the right direction and uh, one peculiarity that i saw was in 6 years there is a uh, 717% you know substantial rise in the purchase of chemical fertilizers it's shocking when the entire world is trying to put down this chemical fertilizers 
I can understand because I I very much relate to the because I've been my spent my lifetime in the mountain ecosystem, so I can relate very well. What kind of political situation must be there? What kind of political compulsions are there for the for the for the public representatives there? I can understand that very much. But then uh, uh, you have the agri organic agri promotion mission that also very positive. That's a is a, something different that you are doing. Uh, we don't have that kind of a mission in at the national level. All state governments have that with us. So like we have a Sikkim Organic Mission now. It is Sikkim Organic Development Agency now. Like Manipur Organic Development you know, Organic Mission Agency is there. Uh, all states have developed. We um, have Mizoram Organic Mission. You have uh, most of the states have their own certification agencies. Karnataka has, uh, Telangana has their certification agencies. Uttarakhand has done extremely well. So each state has their own. But at the national level, we don't have any kind of a, a body that can be you know where. All, all, you know, like an umbrella organization where all missions could meet together once in a way and discuss their issues and sort out issues. Uh, that kind of option is not available in India. Uh, we, we, we work at our own level. A lot of private players in uh, are uh, making hay. Well, it's, it's just shining, sun is shining. So, and often, uh, uh, but the APIDA organization, umbrella organization, as APIDA has has played a very significant role. Uh, Apida definitely is one umbrella organization. We don't because it, it's it's not just you know uh, confined to organic. They do a whole lot of marketing in, in business. It's a business promoting organization. So organic farming is one component. Developing NPOP guidelines one component of uh, Apida. So that's the kind of it. It's very good and uh, uh, the, the organic fertilizer subsidy scheme. I think uh, we the government of Sikkim was uh, you know crying horse. Uh, no, but no, nobody listened that we wanted subsidy for organic fertilizers. Nobody listens to us. Uh, and the, uh, but the, the GST that has been, uh, you know, at least the GST could have been waived off for uh, organic fertilizers, organic inputs. That also is not there for us in India. Uh, you can at least GST free it can be. It could encourage organic, the sustainable food production systems. Uh, if it can be at least that, that campaign, if you can undertake, you know, make it GST free, you know. Uh, at least five to twelve percent that the government is charging on organic inputs that can waived off. It will be a big boon for, you know, it'll be, in a small way it can reduce the cost of production also. Uh, and good that you are starting with uh, one peculiarity that you are starting with one province and two crops. Uh, that was what my my idea was. It was my idea in nineteen in two thousand three when Sikkim wanted to to convert into organic farming. Uh, I was a proponent that we select niche crops. Uh, like large cardamom, ginger, turmeric, and then progress to the other crops, buckwheat, four crops, and then progress to other, but the entire state government wanted to convert the entire agricultural land into organic. So we didn't have our options, so we worked on that. So these are the peculiarities and similarities are uh, many. Or we have a policy, we too have a policy, but whether it is implemented or not implemented, it's not in our hands. So it's the same situation for uh, Shrestha and me. And uh, millet program promotion program, India has also undertaken a massive way of millet promotion. It's doing very well. Uh, people, uh, the public participation, public participation, in fact, people's participation makes movement successful. Uh, we need to ensure people's participation in whatever we are trying to do. So these are the kind of uh, pluses and minuses. Uh, so uh, support for agroecology is there through organic farming in your place. It's there in our place also. So some kind of similarities, some kind of dissimilarities. Thank you. Thank you. That was the first... for, I can go on <clears throat> talking for hours together, stop yes. in between. <laughs> I have to stop you sometime. Um, but it's so good to have you here and uh, to have this wealth of knowledge on board, definitely. Because it's um, by, so, and... you know, organic farming or natural farming cannot be done unless it's a passion. For me, that's the, that's the catch line. It's, it has to, one has to be passionate about it. Otherwise, it's not possible. People will put you down. You know, I have heard, I have, I was ridiculed by my bosses. We it's need all public. the passionate in, people here. So and and that, also in, that also in public, being a research scientist. They put me down just like that. You're oh. talking rubbish. That was a oh, statement. Yes. Organic so farming doesn't so happen. <laughs> Yes, thank you so much, um, Dr. Avaste, for, for your insights on the comparative situation. That was very insightful. So we have... Um, 15 minutes left. If, if possible, leave some space for our um, 
remaining comments and questions, which are many, which you may have seen, um, but also I encourage speakers, of course, to react uh, bilaterally. So Dr. Shrestha, please um, go ahead with um, the comparative view. Um, what are the three peculiarities, similar similarities, which you would like to highlight to our audience? Uh, thank you. In fact, uh, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Avasi has uh, covered in uh, greater detail, so I don't have uh, you know, uh, many things uh, to share uh, regarding uh, the similarities. In fact, uh, similarities means I also find uh, the similarity between two countries, uh, what uh, he has just observed. So regarding, uh, in fact, I won't say it's differences, but learning from India, because India is a huge country. So uh, they are you know, much ahead of Nepal in, in, uh, in this regard as well. Uh, Dr. Avasti said they don't have any um, national policy, but, but I find that uh, they have an organic um, um, farming policy 2005. Which we no, don't I have. Didn't say that. I said I said we have, but it has not been implemented in letter and spirit. That's all. You're right. You're right. And uh, even we don't have a, that focused, very focused policy. You know, uh, organic farming policy. So that's one difference, is, um, if I may. So and again, uh, you have a natural uh, farming mission, uh, 2020, 2022, and uh, similar kind of missions uh, that we run. But like you mentioned. Um, it's a question of uh, implementation, you know. We have a kind of, uh, you know, formative arrangements and the provisions, but implementation is uh, different things. So, uh, and again, that's, a, that's a one or two areas. Another is India is uh, much ahead uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, uh, product diversification and then uh, entrepreneurship development. You have a uh, incubation services there uh, for aspiring um, entrepreneurs and also startups coming up uh, in this area, millets and uh, you know other other uh, minor cereals, and Epeda. Uh, I think Epeda has been in a, in a critical uh, position to that end. Uh, last December we had one um, virtual meeting with Epeda. Uh, I myself was present there. Indian Embassy here organized that program. And then uh, we had uh, uh, sharing and uh, experiences sharing about this International Year of Millets and Millet Promotion uh, Program in our two countries. So uh, I see the difference there uh, in uh, product diversification and uh, product development and entrepreneurship developed. Uh, it's um, much ahead of Nepal in India. So uh, in, the, in Nepal, uh, get to learn from India in, in that regard. Also, you have a one <clears throat> uh, center of excellence, uh, which is a uh, you know, national center of organic farming. Uh, we don't have, a, we've been pushing this agenda for quite some time now. We don't have, like I uh, mentioned yesterday as well, that's on the cards uh, in um, ongoing restructuring process. Uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, submitted one proposal uh, to set up uh, this uh, uh, supreme body to promote organic agriculture, agroecology, and related uh, concepts. And in fact, a few years back, uh, one high-level committee was formed under uh, the chairmanship of then minister, and uh, which had also suggested to set up one that kind of uh, central institution. So. Uh, Nepal get to learn a lot about uh, the experiences from NCOF. Uh, you have, I know, you have a very a good uh, um, system of uh, capacity building and uh, certification and also uh, database. Here, we are lagging much behind in database management of organic agriculture um, and um, agroecology. So that's another areas uh, which uh, Nepal uh, could learn from India. And uh, I think, and lastly, uh, you have the Indian Institute of uh, uh, Millet Research in Hyderabad. 
and uh, it's also promoting uh, you know, millets and through various kinds of resources and germ plasma conservation. Uh, so uh, we don't have that kind of uh, focused uh, research institute. We do have one uh, research institute under the Nepal Agriculture Research Council, which does uh, research on uh, these millets, especially millets, uh, but uh, not that uh, you know scale. The scale is quite low. So um, if we could learn from uh, NCOF, IIMR, and APEDA. Uh, so I request uh, this um, Ingrid and Gabor and the um, organic uh, IFOM, uh, Organic International as well, uh, to help us in uh, building um, a relationship between uh, the two governments and uh, uh, you know institutions, parallel institutions, horizontal uh, collaboration as well. Uh, we've been trying hard to establish contacts with these organizations, with these institutions in India, but haven't been quite able. Uh, we are even trying to reach out to the Indian embassy here. So if uh, uh, IFOMA Organic International could help us in this regard. So these were a few points. Uh, otherwise, uh, he extensively has extensively covered the similarities and differences between the two countries. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. That there are also quite a number of um, similarities, also a number of peculiarities that are very interesting, um, perhaps to our audience. Um, I encourage everyone present to add a few more of uh, peculiarities or similarities, if you are aware of, in the chat, um, so that we can take these up later in the report of the main findings. Um, and now I would like to call again my colleague uh, Vladislav Smilo to report on perhaps some questions. We have, I see, 10 minutes left, right? Vlad, are you there? Thank you, Ingrid. Uh, yes, we have some questions uh, that our speakers probably didn't see. Uh, so for instance, the question to Dr. Shrestha, uh, can you share the procedure how farmers can access to the incentives for uh, millets farming uh, at the local level? Of course, if you know and can share it in short. Okay, in short, yeah, it's, it's long anyway. Uh, so if I go for typing, it will take a long time. So <laughs> I better, you know, explain it in a bit. Like I mentioned, uh, we, we work um, with the uh, 133 uh, rural uh, municipalities and uh, municipalities, that's uh, local governments. So um, the approach is like uh, uh, we identify the, the production buckets, we call it block. So mm -hmm. farmers are organizing the blocks. So when they are organizing the block, so they are entitled to receive various kinds of support. And regarding that uh, 18,000 that someone is asking, uh, uh, it's about the local level, they have to decide to which crop should be prioritized. And based on that, farmers need to apply or that um, farmers from that particular block need to apply for that uh, incentive, for that um, uh, cash support, and then, on the uh, 45th day, within 45th day, the officials from the local agricultural unit, Palikas, or the local government's agricultural unit, uh, does this monitoring and field verification. And when they are satisfied, and then they uh, you know, um, transfer the money. This is the simple process. Uh, so we have uh, developed uh, guidelines to that uh, you know, effect as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Another interesting question probably to both speakers. Uh, so we see right now um, high investments into the infrastructure. So a lot of uh, roads, railways, lines, and uh, they impact uh, the availability of agricultural land. So how can we uh, produce more food on limited land considering this um, uh, with the help, of course, of uh, uh, organic agriculture and natural farming and agroecology? And how do we um, sustain the competition between conventional farming and sustainable food systems? Dr. Avasti, 
Would you like to go for go first? Hey, this has been an issue uh, we have been grappling in all mountain states with. Uh, see, when I first came to Sikkim, the arable land uh, was substantial. It was around 120,000 hectares of area. And by the time we left, it was 80,000 hectares. So you can imagine how rapidly, in a period of around 30 years, how the agricultural land has been uh, diverted or converted to some other purpose. So one has to grapple with this issue head on because um, the organic and natural farming are most suited for you know the disadvantaged areas like rain fed areas and um, you know so you know, mountain agriculture is most suited we have small lands it's easily manageable so a lot of it involves manual labor mechanization for organic farming just isn't there and organic and organic mechanized farming uh, you know, has its own disadvantages unless, and one has to go in for practices of conservation agriculture. We called, we, ter we termed it as uh, organic conservation agriculture. So unless, you know, do this, it, it builds up over a period of time. The soil organic matter has got to build up. You see, even otherwise, mountain ecosystems are low external input sustainable agriculture systems. And uh, uh, under this uh, particular uh, uh, organic or uh, sustainable food production systems. Uh, uh, we need to intensify, the options are available. We need to intensify the per unit production of any kind of a crop that we have, whatever the land is remaining. See, most of the mountain states will still, despite your best efforts, will have to depend on their daily food requirements to a large extent on the supplies from the other states, from the public distribution systems or whatever it is, from wherever it comes. Because we don't have the size of the, the arable land to feed our population, the resident population. See, Sikkim has a very small resident population of around six and a half lakhs. Not even a million, which is 0.65 million. But then you have almost three times the number of visitors, travelers who come there. It's a tourism area. So you have almost two million people who come in as tourists. You got to feed them as well. You have a sizable population of the Indian Armed Forces. You got to feed them as well. So we don't have, even if you try to produce the way, increase the production to double the production, we'll still be finding, you know, we'll be still finding it difficult to feed the entire population of the resident and the floating population, as we call them, travelers and uh, the soldiers and all kinds of people. You have migrant labor that comes in for. Uh, all kinds of construction work. You have a lot of industries that have come. You have a lot of people coming in. Migrant uh, workers have come mm -hmm. in. So you, how do mm -hmm. we manage this? So we'll have to. We, when you know, everybody was questioning, what is the food security aspect of Sikkim? Sikkim cannot be full, a fully food secure state because it doesn't have the size of the arable land to feed to feed around 2.5 million people in a year. We don't have the land. Mm -hmm. But then our intention was environmental protection, conservation of nature, conservation of your uh, water quality, your forest systems, you know, improving, you know, improving your, the quality of your life. That was more important rather than trying to say that we are trying to f feed the entire population through our small land. It's not possible. Thank so you. Thank this you is very much. Part Dr. of the answer. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Shasta, do you have something to add? Uh, I fully agree with uh, Dr. Avasti, but uh, you know uh, there shouldn't be any confusion, uh, as I feel uh, that way. Uh, that uh, um, organic farming or agroecology uh, is uh, anywhere, uh, you know, uh, not not um, profitable or not sustainable when compared with the chemical agriculture. But uh, it's a kind of uh, if you ask me, it's a, to me, it's a kind of you know way of life as well, and it's a long-term uh, you know uh, vision. So we can't talk of uh, instantly convert our chemical agriculture best uh, system instantly into uh, agriculture, which is not possible. So we have to first uh, rely on ecological principles and go for gradually uh, go for uh, you know towards the agroecology uh, approach. 
And as of now, like I mentioned in my presentations as well, we need to have a, some kind of balance between chemical agriculture and then uh, this agroecology. And uh, in case of Nepal, if you ask me, it quite fits in case of Nepal, we have a very limited area, limited irrigated plains where we go for producing basic cereals, which helps us, you know, uh, you know food security, so to say. But the constraint, that structural constraint that we are having, and also the agroecological, the geographical constraint we have here, that's a kind of boon to me, because like also Dr. Avasti mentioned that we have a small scale farming, uh, small holders, you know, a rain fed agriculture, and largely untouched by you know, chemical agriculture. So when we go for utilizing this small piece of land, then uh, household food security, nutrition security is possible. And also uh, you can uh, make some earning uh, selling uh, your, your organic products. So this is how we should be uh, moving ahead. Yeah, that's all. Thank you, thank you. Dr. Shrestha, Ingrid, do we have time for one more question or? Very quickly, I think. Very quick replies, Very quickly, two minutes yeah. left. Okay, then a very quick question to Dr. Shrestha regarding again the policy on MIC. Uh, so uh, regarding the conservation of MIC, how does this program uh, uh, ensures that uh, property rights of small scale farmers are protected? Very important question. Very important one, in fact, and we are well aware of that. Uh, we, we are in the process of uh, the central government in the process of uh, uh, having in place the uh, um, farmers' right to protection and farmers' right to bill. It's, it's still pending uh, for more than a decade uh, in the central parliament. Uh, and we are quite aware of that. And uh, we, we don't have uh, our own um, sui generis system as it. But uh, with the other related uh, policy framework and regulatory framework, what we, what we do with, uh, within this uh, MIC promotion scheme is under this conservation uh, component or strategy, uh, like I mentioned before, uh, we trust the local institution, grassroots institution, that's community seed bank, and uh, we have a provision of community biodiversity register, and where, uh, you know, community seed bank, registers the native uh, species, crop species and varieties. And uh, uh, when we will have uh, that um, law in place and uh, the farmer's right on that particular, the community rights and that particular, uh, you know, varieties will be established by law. So we are employing that community biodiversity register in the first place for the ownership. And secondly, uh, we uh, go for you know, registering, like I mentioned before, registering the land races. When they register uh, land races in the uh, National Seed Board, and they get ownership of that particular land races. So this is how we are implementing farmers' rights uh, through this scheme, uh, the grassroots. Yeah. Great, thank you so thank much you. for clarifying on this uh, last question so quickly. So uh, we have come to the close already of our panel discussion and um, the plan is now that we take a short break of 15 minutes and reconvene at uh, 3 uh, p.m. 3, yeah, 3, 10 p.m. Indian Standard Time. So in 15 minutes, please be back here. Don't miss out on this opportunity. You can introduce yourself, connect with fellow participants, exchange on key policy actions needed. Again, we will split into four breakout sessions, one concerning sustainable food production systems, one on food value chain. The third will be on consumption, as well as last but not least, one will focus on coordination, policy coherence. So please, please be back on time. We look much forward to the discussions in these sessions. Thank you so much.
a good break. I can't see too many cameras on, which makes me a bit uncertain about uh, people having returned. Maybe if you could just give us a sign, <clears throat> like uh, a clapping hand or <laughs> a thumbs up uh, to show that you're back, and then we can uh, assign you to, to the breakout groups. Because um, this is exactly how we are going to proceed now. You also highlighted that there should be more discussions, um, more interactive discussions um, among uh, participants. And uh, this is what we would like to do now. And we actually uh, leave a bit more time than yesterday for, for these um, interactive discussions uh, in breakout groups. We will have uh, one hour and 20 minutes uh, to discuss in these uh, small groups. Um, the key policy actions needed to advance sustainable food systems and agroecology, and also um, to come up with the first set of uh, recommendations. Um, so we decided to structure the session, um, again, based, based on a food systems approach. Um, like we said yesterday, basically any division is artificial, but we have to find one in order to facilitate um, the discussions better because it usually works much better in, in uh, small groups. Um, so we organized you and our, our, us ourselves um, in the following breakout uh, sessions. We will have room number one, growing harvesting, resilient, inclusive, and diverse food production systems. So it's about farming, it's about production. Second one, room number two, processing, packaging, transport, and access to markets, sustainability along all food, food value chains. Then we, in, at, um, in uh, room three, we are looking at uh, consumption and also awareness raising, particularly that of uh, consumers. So we, we want to focus on sustainable and healthy diets there. Room number four is, is the overarching one, coordination, integration, mainstreaming, policy coherence, and consistency. So you will be assigned automatically, also based on your wish in the chat uh, to the different rooms. There, in these um, breakout uh, groups and, and uh, uh, rooms, we would really like you to, to uh, discuss actively. And um, there we will encourage you to participate to use the raise your hand function. But I think you, you already know this, um, having used Zoom for so long. Um, and uh, it's going to be the four of us, Jonah, Vlad, Ingrid, and myself, again, to serve you as, as moderators or facilitators of, of the breakout groups. But we are not going to be uh, your uh, rapporteur. So please make sure that, that you select a rapporteur at, uh, at the start of the, of the session. So after one hour and 20 minutes, altogether 80 minutes, the sessions will end and he will automatically be directed back uh, to the plenary. Just like yesterday, um, you will get notifications of the time coming to, coming to the end of the session. And then uh, we will transfer you back uh, to the plenary. Um, I think um, that's it. Everything should be clear. Most of the things are like yesterday to those who, who were here with us yesterday. Um, and I guess it's time to just for us to, to go to the rooms. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, welcome back to the plenary. Um, we much hope you had some great and inspiring discussions during the breakout sessions. And we now look much forward to hear the highlights from our rapporteurs. 
which are the key policies, the key policy measures governing food systems, which policy steps are needed to advance sustainable food systems and agroecology. During this session, we would love to invite you once again to make additional comments. We can, um, and which will find their way either into the main summary or we can share them still if time allows. So please, I would love to call now the first rapporteur of the breakout session, which was on resilient, inclusive and diverse food production systems. Please share your name, function, organization before you start. You have about seven minutes. Who is it? Who has it? Who has, who is the rapporteur of the first session? Gabor, do you know? Yeah. I am Kemraj Dahar, professor at the Institute of Agriculture and Earth Sciences, Trivandrum University, but recently retired. I am going to present. Can I share my screen? Yes, sure. I hope it's technically possible, but it should be. It's coming? Yes, wonderful. Okay. Thank you. This is the product of our rigorous discussion among our friends. And uh, whatever our friends want to add to it, they are free. Before that, I would like to tell shortly about the previous presentation. Uh, while talking the policy, our previous two distinguished presenters, they presented. Uh, on the policy of India and Nepal. What uh, our friends, myself, our group considered or got the message that policies as they are there, but implementation is very weak. Though in case of India, Indian government or central government has developed many policies and even has tried to implement in its level. But when we talk to the local farmers level or level of provincial government, state governments, that are those are something not that very clear and uh, not that effective. In case of Nepal, there are so many policies, though not directly related to organic or agricultural farming, but indirectly. For example, agro-biodiversity policy, agroforestry policy, um, fertilizer policy, in all those systems. Increase, increasing soil or any matter is one of the vital aspect, aspects. But the implementation part is rather weak, that Dr. Sreshta also, also already told. And now, if we want to make our agriculture resilient and more agroecological, uh, working on in agricultural framework or agro, uh, agroecological agriculture, we talk to say, we can say, in that case, we have made some points some points through which we can develop or, uh, or we can uh, sensitize the people and develop the policy in, the, in that line or in those, based on those points. For example, first we sensitize first of all, we have to sensitize the people on what? First, we have to sensitize people for food. Because when we talk of production, policy for production, if we don't talk about food, we don't uh, good uh, better understand the food, food and food system, culture, habit, food health, and so and so, then we can't talk of we can't talk of policy, we can't make good policy. That's a first of all, we have to raise the awareness about the food. Why food, how food, what food, where food, all those things are should be considered in policy so that a person can feel himself or herself that he or she is getting good food. And in that sense, health comes here, culture comes here, food habit comes here. The paradox is that, or unfortunately, our food habit is very, very drastically changing due to, due to market, due to corporate production, uh, production that are being available everywhere in the market, that's why. And second is, when we talk of food, or related to food, biodiversity. 
the question comes from where the food comes. Okay, in our local conditions, there are so many many things that generally were used to uh, to to make the food. But nowadays, only two or three crops are in the sin in the in, in the market, and the products many products diversified products of those two three crops are available everywhere. And our uh, there are so many lost crops. And biodiversity is very important, not only for the food, but for the resilience of farming, for uh, just uh, livelihood, and so and so. And whom to sensitize or whom to focus our policy? There should be officials, like in India, Dr. Devendra told that in India, officials generally they are reluctant to understand agro agro eco ecological importance because they are taught through green revolution education. And for those teachers, farmers, especially big farmers, big farmers are not caring much about agroecology because they want to earn money using chemicals. Chemicals are very quick to earn money, but though if we don't talk of long-term effect, but short-term chemicals are helping farmers to, to earn as money as big money as possible. Technology, basically, when we talk, when, when we talk of agroecology, Two very basic technology we have to develop, demonstrate, we have to make, make the policy so that that policy enhances or that policy enable, enables to develop such technologies, either through research or through teaching, that is plant production and plant nutrition, soil health and plant health. Because uh, the healthier the soil, the healthier the product, the healthier the product, the healthier the mind is, then healthier will be the environment. That's very important. That's a when policy matter comes, technology development policy. Do, uh, focusing on the developing technologies, healthy technologies are very important. Then research. Basically, research should be on all these food and, and, uh, and food plan, nutrition and health protection. All these research should be focused on these uh, plant nutrition, plant protection, and food culture. Not only that, should be added more on local knowledge, traditional wisdom, on which our whole agriculture system was being based for the time immemorial. Then research in universities, in fact, generally uh, we do research, but our research, university research is only in the libraries. The research is mostly based on the thesis, guiding research, and the national research system should focus on agroecology. Again, basically in, in these three things, food, uh, protection and soil. Then extension. Now, probably we have research, we have technology. There is. But it's very important to extend to that the technology to farmers. To, to extend the technology to farmers, uh, our, our friends uh, did emphasis on mostly on the demonstration. Demonstration is very good way to extend the technology. And nowadays, farmer, farmer, farmer to farmer and through areas social networkings and the school gardening school is very important uh, means of technology transfer because children when ever they know something they retain for a, for a long time and they, they, that sometimes they may go throughout their life that's a school gardening practically they do then the things there and that, that those, those gardening should be based on agriculture principles subsidy because nowadays, organic agriculture, agro, agro, agroecology, agriculture are very, very uh, subsidy based. That subsidy, in one sense, for example, in Nepal, I talk, the subsidy is only for export commodities, tea, coffee, and so on. And that is only for big traders, big farmers, let's say. And but however, the margin farmers, those farmers are only getting fringe subsidy of chemical fertilizer rather. And nowadays, we have to shift the concept of uh, that uh, subsidy is either shift subsidy from chemical fertilizer to organic fertilizer or organic inputs, or give subsidy not to uh, big farmers for export commodity, but to marginal farmers who are the real workers, real farmers to produce foods and uh, things. Then education is very important. I already told you that school gardening is one of the one of the steps to educate the uh, uh, farmers. At the same time, early farmers, the children. Then, if we talk of higher education, 
going in academic courses in schools as in the university. Everywhere we have to keep them aware of the agroecological principles because if there is no good soil, there is no good food, there is no good food, there is no good mine. In that sense, a chain, a type of chain of uh, issues, chain of the good messages through the education should be given so that they can love soil, love earth, and love themselves. And finance, always, generally, it is obvious that if you shift from chemical farming to organic farming, the yield reduction for the short term is obvious. In that sense, whatever, either you have to give good technology to farmer and assure the farmers, okay, this technology will not, will help you not to reduce the yield, will help you to enhance the yield. Okay, then farm, farmers will be convinced. Otherwise, there is word from uh, so-called our traditional Europeans, they say conventional to organic, that transition period, if farmers suffer, we have to give some chances to just breed them so that they can feel themselves assured of their production. And the finance uh, and uh, also tax system, if there is tax system, we have to reduce the tax. If they have they, they want to take their products to somewhere in the market, there also we can help them with, with, with uh, some financial support. Production, it's very, very important to note that generally, if you talk of making all through the whole the country organic, it is futile, it doesn't work. That's why always you have to look after a crop which is which has been co-evolved in the certain place, certain needs, where you don't have to much effort, much uh, put effort to produce that, that crop. That you have to uh, you have choice or you have to choose the crop or choose the location where you can uh, do that without using any external input. That is being done in Nepal in most of the part, government official, it's not government, but generally I, I NGO data says about 26 to 30% is Nepal's Nepal agriculture organic by default. That means people are producing niche species products so that they don't have to uh, use much effort to finish, to, to produce the product. Certification, certification also is a matter of use, use uh, I, should, I should say threat to farmers. Farmers say, oh, so use money we need. Where, where, from where uh, we can get that money? That's why we don't want to do that certification, certification systems. For that, to just avoid that threat, threat, what we can do is let's talk of PGS, uh, participatory grant system, where if possible, just make the producers and consumers meet together and uh, talk themselves what they want, what did they do? That's very important rather than to be, if you want to produce and sell to other countries outside market, uh, we know that organic standard, standards, uh, standards are there. If they want to produce for the standards of that country, that uh, recipient organization is okay, no problem. But whenever, talk, whenever we talk of marginal farmers, they are not able to, to do that. That's a, for them, PGS is very important and the policy, it should be uh, inbuilt. And lastly, the market. I would, this is my own opinion. Market, I would, I would not talk much about bigger market since our farmers are very small, uh, holding farmers, very marginal farmers. Why don't we talk about the local market? Strengthening local market that will make, uh, that, that uh, may create the job for the local people, may create uh, uh, social coherence, may create social, even social culture and system to be retained in the place. There's a local mystery in local market that will enable, local, enable the local economy. That's why through organic, through healthy food, first, nowadays, now first we have to think of local. Nowadays, we have, in government, we have three systems, local uh, union, province, and local. Local government or local system is very strong, very authoritative. That in a sense, if local government can just assess or enumerate, assess the the people, food, culture, subsist uh, and all the systems of the place, then local market, local production, local consumer production um, producers meet together will be very good, I think. And at, at last, resilience is the word very important for ecology and for which we strive for agri ecological things. That is, our nowadays, we must, we have many outside our externalities, for example, climate change. 
even in that sense also using local crops local system local ecological processes following local uh, using local biodiversity all these come together in agriculture principles and the resilience is there that's all these things should be considered while uh, talking the policy of a country mm -hmm. of a place uh, of a um, local government or national government thank you very much thank you so much uh, professor dahal um, great. So I suggest that this time, um, if there are integrations to Professor Dahal's um, comprehensive overview of what have been discussed in the first breakout session, please put them into the meeting chat um, and we will see if we can still um, mention them at the end of the session, if time allows. Let's move on to the next uh, rapporteur and um, let's see if we can hear from the group on food value chains. So yeah, we had assigned the rapporteur, but he left us for another meeting. <laughs> so I'm taking this uh, the last minute. Okay. Great, <laughs> so um, we were in the uh, group of food value chains. Uh, we talked first about the existing policies, right? In each state and in the case of India, we, um, uh, we told that there are the policy differ from state to state as agriculture is a, a state subject, but at the national level there is the mission, uh, the mission of organic chain in the northeast that encourages the organic value chains. And uh, when we then went uh, in specific of the uh, states, we talked about the case of Uttarakhand, where uh, there is uh, a policy for organic farming, but there is also some support for hybrid seeds so we see some uh, controversy in there but uh, that leads also to some sort of conflicts but of course these are uh, being uh, discussed and uh, uh, solved then um, there is also pgs and there uh, and also complete organic then we also talk about the national year of millets and on the scheme of the minimum support prices for millets in uttarakhand and uh, this uh, uh, scheme encourages farmers to increase their acreage and it is uh, seen as a very successful measure that is expected to impact positively millet productions. Um, then uh, when we go to Bhutan, uh, we have uh, told that uh, we have seen that Bhutan has a more holistic approach toward uh, policies in regard to value chains. Uh, Bhutan has a national organic uh, uh, standard, but uh, Bhutan depends uh, on accreditation agencies from other countries, such as India, and uh, not recognized outside the country. So, in addition, in Bhutan, we have seen also some challenges or rule, uh, specifically in regards to import uh, policies. Uh, for example, for Bhutan, uh, it's difficult to import second-hand equipment or machinery due to the difficulties to get permits such as visa policies. Uh, and this we have seen as a hindering uh, policy to uh, sustainable food systems in regards to value chain. <clears throat> uh, for Nepal, uh, of course, there are, as uh, Dr. Dahal said before, a lot of uh, policies that are indirectly uh, connected to uh, sustainable value chain as well in, in Nepal. But uh, what we have realized is that we needed uh, more co-investment uh, from the government. Uh, then we have gone to the way forward. So we have come up with some suggestions. Uh, we have taken up again the minimum support uh, price for diff to have it for different crops. And this can be also a measure that could work uh, very uh, easily in uh, Bhutan uh, and Nepal if coordination allows. Then we have also to enable policies uh, in order to have appropriate technology, because this is one of uh, the main issues that we have uh, identified. Also to rise uh, uh, competitiveness uh, uh, for organic uh, products. Uh, we, uh, we bring again back uh, the point to get uh, on the table the forest department in the case of India. 
as this is not the case. Uh, but uh, this, uh, uh, for Bhutan, uh, this is not an issue because uh, uh, there is already good coordination among uh, departments. So generally, we also talk that uh, we need a more dedicated institution at the, the national level uh, that uh, talks about uh, agroecology and also including value chains. Then we also uh, identify a quality and value addition that should be also the focus on the policies and how to encourage farmers to take up this role of aggregation, value additions, branding and marketing, such as also private investment is a must to bring in infrastructure, technology, online marketing, export and youth employment. And of course, uh, uh, we see also important uh, a shift of subsidies from chemical fertilizer to organic fertilizer. So if I have missed anything, uh, I just call in my group. <laughs> um, Thanks, Donna. <laughs> Great. Someone else to add on what has been already very comprehensively presented by Jona. Some uh, additional remarks on that from the team present still here. Umesh Kumar Tamang Lama, I see, hand up. Please, Namaste, everybody. Your... Uh, yeah, uh, uh, there's one point uh, missing. I, uh, I, I would have reported Jonah while in room number two, but uh, uh, I couldn't. Uh, the, the point is that uh, these agro-organic products are niche products and they, they cost high. Uh, they cost high. And uh, the thing is, there is a government policy that uh, the 13% 30, VAT will be added uh, to, to the value uh, of the product. That makes uh, really higher, you know. There is, there is, there is a uh, overhead uh, from the supermarket and there is already, uh, you know, the cost of production is very high, all maps uh, very, uh, you know, costly. So if the bat is added to such product, then it, it would be really costlier in the market. So that means that it challenges the, the, the competitiveness of the products. So uh, we need to consider that uh, the government need to consider that the either VAT should be lifted or should be compensated by some other ways so that uh, the product will be competitive. That's what I want. I wanted to say here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, very important remark and. Um... And I see also in Germany discussions on these lines. So um, at least for some products. So um, let's hand over then go to the next uh, rapporteur of the session on consuming and sustainable and healthy diets. Vlad, is it you again or someone else? No, this time we found a courageous volunteer to present <laughs> our findings. Uh, just uh, from my side, I will tell that we tried as much as possible to focus on the demand side. We did not, did not touch a lot uh, policies that support the production side. Uh, so some subsidies for organic fertilizers or so on, but mostly on consumer side. And our volunteer, Jan, will present our findings. And uh, if I have something to add, I will add it. Please, Jan, the floor is yours. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I, uh, I am Yam Kumari Sreshtra uh, from Nepal. Currently, I am working uh, as a senior horticulture development officer uh, in the National Center for uh, Fruit Development under the Ministry of Agriculture and uh, Livestock Development. Uh, now, let me present some uh, point which we have discussed in under the healthy diet uh, uh, sector. Uh, we participated for uh, very few people, four, three, four people from uh, India and Nepal only, and then there is absence of Bhutan. So what, what we have discussed, uh, let me present uh, some point and maybe uh, later 
uh, uh, maybe uh, some other colleagues, maybe they some aid some whatever I miss I have miss, missed there. So we discussed uh, first about the what we have a policy and program that ne uh, positively or negatively affect the on consumer side for healthy diet. Uh, and we we summarize like that like. Uh, in uh, like in India, we have some uh, policy and program like uh, natural food security mission program, and uh, uh, this is the uh, positive. Uh, in it uh, gives a positive impact on the consumer uh, on healthy diet. Uh, similarly, uh, uh, the another program has the public pro procurement for healthy food in school program is in school. This is also the positive impact. Uh, they have also India also have the minimum support price, but uh, it have both uh, positive and ne negative impact. Uh, I could not uh, on a, I could not uh, point point just point down this the what is the plus and negative point. Maybe the uh, my Indian colleague they uh, summarize later, uh, and uh, and India have also the uh, logo. Uh, uh, for healthy uh, products, like uh, they have also the government logo and on sub uh, other sub uh, private sector logo also they 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 are currently they are in practice. Uh, similarly, government support uh, on uh, sales of a healthy product on a railway transport system. This is also the good impact uh, on healthy food for the consumer. Uh, and uh, and they have also di different certification system for the um, for the logo provide logo on uh, food system but sometimes they may uh, may uh, lead the confusion to the consumer which one is uh, uh, good or which one is uh, uh, not so good like this uh, it's the parts from india and from the uh, in in nepal side uh, we, we we have some uh, positive uh, policy and program like organic mission program and some uh, promotion of tra traditional food program like a millet and local local products we have so so we have government program here uh, in implemented here and some negative uh, part they we have some uh, promotion of uh, conventional farming like uh, subsidy on the uh, fertilizer subsidy on the uh, who produce more they they they, they can get uh, more subsidy uh, from the government side. So this program may be uh, some negative impact on healthy foods also. Uh, so uh, there is another uh, issue like the, the, there is a lack of trust among consumer on healthy food. So there's a, uh, there is no branding, uh, some have uh, branding, but it's not uh, so a trust, trusty label because of the, the the traceability system of the product is not so clear. So this is uh, some uh, confusion, uh, some it is makes some confusion to the uh, consumer level. Uh, so another point we have discussed about the, what is the tax system that promote the uh, healthy food uh, in the country. So both in uh, Nepal and uh, India, we, we uh, did not feel that recognized uh, that policy like, like the uh, encourage the healthy food so tax exemption for the healthy food like like this and uh, more tax for the conventional food we did not rec recognize so much uh, and another system we have uh, the promotion of uh, some uh, food system like this the cold storage facilities for healthy food in India we uh, we discussed about that uh, and in case of Nepal there is a uh, not so uh, like a Polish storage facility, separate uh, such, such a facility. But we have a, in Nepal, we have a system of uh, separate sales in supermarket chain. And uh, in um, e even in the small grocery, they have the system of separate sale for local foods or organic food and like whatever this label. And so, so we, we have in Nepal also have the uh, government support for the local market promotion, like a weekly market uh, uh, like this. And the uh, support for the uh, exhibition of the 
healthy foods, organic foods. It's, it's like uh, we have a, that program from the government support. And, on, and for the um, uh, way forward, how to promote uh, this uh, uh, policy for the uh, on the consumer side for the health promotion of, of uh, healthy food. So we we discussed about the uh, public awareness is the main uh, uh, things. So we need some consumer awareness program. Uh, so how to uh, uh, how know how to build. Uh, and in awareness site in consumer also, uh, and some uh, we need some uh, sufficient la labeling system for the healthy foods, and even in conventional food, what is the effect of uh, healthy foods, and what is the bad effect of uh, conventional food? So, if we have a like, like such kind of system uh, of in on la on product labeling, so it may helps. For the con uh, for the healthy food for uh, awareness for the consumer side, uh, like we need a branding uh, uh, specific branding system, and sometimes we need uh, also need the enforcement from regulatory uh, regulatory authority for the punishment who violate the to sell the unhealthy products. Also, we need uh, we discuss on that way. Uh, similarly, uh, testing facility of for the healthy foods. Even we don't uh, don't have sub, uh, such a sufficient facility in everywhere. Sometimes uh, maybe in the city area we have some uh, in limited uh, places, and even the the capacity of this uh, testing facility is not uh, so strengthened. So um, even consumer side and even in the producer side, they they have uh, sufficient access to they need to have the sufficient access for the testing facility also. So in that, yeah, if we promote on that side, there's uh, the consumer maybe uh, get uh, help, help from to get the healthy foods uh, and for their, for their uh, food. Uh, I have jotted down in that part. Maybe uh, some thing I did not uh, expel here explain here so my colleagues on team may help to me to more uh, clarify on that uh, issue thank you thank you very much Yam. Um, you did a great summary of our findings um, i have nothing to add except that you mentioned about this uh, public uh, minimum price for farmers I, I put a link in the chat so that other participants can read that actually this minimum support prices may negatively impact the consumption of healthy diets because they make uh, prices for products more expensive. So not necessarily it is a, a positive measure, uh, measure. But otherwise, um, I have nothing to add. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vlad. And thank you very much, um, Ms. Shrestha. Great. And um, is someone else having some additional comments or remarks on the consumption point um, on the healthy diets? Is Have all points been covered well or is there anything else people wish to highlight? If not, we can go and move on to the last rapporteur. It is again, Anita. Again, a courageous woman. So happy to hand over the word to you who will talk about the results of the coordination breakout session. So last but not the least, we were seven of us in the group. And uh, so we started with this whole concept of coordination in food system and actually the dialogue, we kind of challenged that whole concept in itself, like that coordination comes only after we have a stated uh, program clarity, you know, like a, uh, in the sense, coordination for what? What are we really talking about? Because often, uh, most nations, there's party politics that comes in. And this, this kind of uh, discussion led to the fact that while agriculture uh, policies get made by the central government, it's, the, it's a federal, it's a state subject, and that the states are free to define the way forward for themselves. So, as it was presented earlier in the uh, morning plenaries, that there are 
policies and policies and initiatives and initiatives, but each one uh, has their own mandate. So what is it that we are really trying to coordinate? Do we have a common ground to stand on and figure out uh, what we want to do? So, uh, and that if we have that clarity, the coordination will uh, come after that. So it, this was kind of bringing us back to this whole thing of, uh, like what we discussed yesterday and everybody felt that the mountain perspective, mountain specific policy is still missing. So uh, uh, we kind of uh, discussed mechanisms on how can we go about with doing that. And we recognize that there are some existing initiatives, bodies, like in the case of India, there is uh, the Northeast uh, six states or seven states, if you want to include some other part, have a designated um, uh, initiatives looking at themselves as a whole, right? So we also have uh, uh, the Niti Aayog, which is the equivalent of the Planning Commission for India. There was a desk which was designated for mountain uh, policies, which is lying in a bit of a um, uh, is dysfunctional right now. But then there are opportunities with the Ministry of Environment. There are opportunities that exist. And if we can kind of get our act together and get this much felt need of a common policy document, which is mountain specific, then we could go and knock on the doors of all the existing platforms and get people on board. Like the Indian Mountain Initiative, which also has this thing about getting the parliamentarians on board. And I was just did a quick check on the website. Apparently 200 parliamentarians, we have knocked on their uh, doors through this initiative. Similarly, Nepal felt that while they don't have this problem of a mainland versus a mountain, this thing, they, they but Nepal also kind of feels that there is a lacuna somewhere in the policy formulation and that they also have a planning commission equivalent, so to say. Uh, so essentially, if we could, and and because of this felt need, and probably it's an opportune moment for us to uh, uh, develop a common understanding as a as a platform and present ourselves to to all these various other players. So at that level, we also thought that this whole concept of food systems in itself is a novel approach to look the way to look at it. You know, right from uh, production to the markets and all the players and stakeholders in it is kind of a very nice holistic way of looking at life. And also in the concept of mountains, there's this whole sustainable development goals and everything kind of comes in, um, in into it. So co common certification was also a point which was raised and at, to that point, uh, we also mentioned that the FAO has a mountain partnership desk um, you know, housed uh, in its office and this common uh, PGS as a certification process was discussed and the first steps was kind of taken where a common norm by all the mountain countries of the world, right from Central Asia to Andes, one step like working towards a common platform has been taken. Idea being that this whole kind of a geographical indicator, indication like mountains, you know, like Switzerland has done it for themselves, you know, whether we all could also have this kind of a, a premium to our lives, so to say, through this food systems dialogue, if we could develop a common understanding. Um, essentially, yeah, essentially, I think this was the gist of, of our discussions, unless until I've missed out on some uh, important topic. Thanks. Thank you, Anita. Um, someone else coming um, in let from me, our let group. Let me add one thing, uh, Ingrid. It's yes, Dr. Avastay, please. It's, it's not Indian Mountain Initiative, it's Integrated Mountain Initiative. Apologies, yes, the name has been changed to Integrated Yeah, it was changed some time back, yeah. Some time ago, yes. Yeah, yeah. Great. So that was it from your side. Okay, so anyone else um, would like to add something on coordination mechanisms, on coordination policy coherence, consistency? We still have four minutes left, so people can chip in their ideas. I see some people have already also to leave. We thank you, everyone. And um, 
if there is no other comment, then let's um, move to, and I hand over to my colleague, Gabor. Thank you very much, Ingrid. And um, particular thanks to, to all of you. I think this, this has been very insightful and um, full of a, a lot of great content. Um, so particular thanks uh, to those who, who volunteered to be reporters. Um, and you have all done a great job, but, but I think uh, everybody contributed in, in a very active manner. So we are really thankful for this. Um, so I think uh, for so there's not much left, Ingrid, right? Then, um, then to conclude and to to draw your attention to to the poll, to the final poll that um, we would be running in a similar way to to what we have done um, yesterday. And once again, uh, we would like to thank uh, all of you who who took the effort to, to fill in the poll uh, yesterday. Now we would like to um, hear from you about what, well, on the one hand, the, the usefulness of, of the two, two days for yourself. Um, and um, yeah, give us an evaluation on, on a scale of one to 10. And again, uh, those who, who, who changed their opinions or those who have not yet filled in the, the questionnaire yesterday, please tell us how, how we could improve. Uh, I didn't do it, Gabor, I didn't do it yesterday because I didn't know how to do it. I didn't do it, I have not done it yesterday also. Please. please uh, send, send me link. We will, yeah, yeah. It's, it's in the chat. I hope. That's it. And we can uh, also share it afterwards via email again. Exactly. Please, yeah. so yes, yesterday, uh, all participants got, got an email, and today it's going to be the same. <clears throat> so we also want to hear from you about your major takeaways and uh, whether you actually agree with the conclusions that, that we have made so far. Uh, what is still very important for us is that any of you who are interested and have the time to join the task force or organizing committee, I think from now on we can stick to the task force name, um, then please, please do so and please send us uh, your phone numbers because we have a WhatsApp group for this and also your email addresses so that uh, we can add you to the already existing uh, email list. And let us know who else you think we should have at this table um, to talk to us um, and send us uh, their, their contact details. So please take some minutes and uh, go, go to the link, which I believe is now in the chat, and please enter your, your comments there. And uh, we will share, of course, uh, the results of this poll uh, via email just like we will share uh, everything else, all the materials that, will sh that were shared uh, today, like uh, PowerPoint presentations and all the conclusions that, that were made by the rapporteurs and so on. Uh, and also a summary of, of the event. <clears throat> we will design a, a web page for this and uh, everything will be uh, made available because we really continue for, for the future uh, of this uh, process. So with this, um, I would just like to thank you very much uh, on behalf of, of the two uh, facilitating organizations. Um, and it, it, it was really inspiring and great to, to have seen you, so many of you, joining us uh, on this journey and on this, these uh, uh, workshop uh, sessions today. Um, and I think it was it was quite intense, right? So we had two days uh, with a lot of content. Um, I personally feel really satisfied with with what we have achieved, and I can see that this is this is really promising for for the future. Um, so we will always be there for you, available 
just just contact us so there was a lot of food for thought for us for for i hope for everyone of course we will learn from from the poll um and we we really much hope that you enjoyed and look forward to seeing you next time again thanks yes thank you so much it was also from my side again thank you so much sincere sincere thanks to all of you who participated yesterday today so actively we also thank very much the deutsche gesellschaft für internationale zusammenarbeit gz gmbh which on behalf of the german federal ministry for Co economic cooperation and development bmz supported this timely event and big thanks also go to our back end team who has been busily preparing this event in particular I would like to thank Jonah Hisa, Valadislav Smilo, Patrick German, and Joanita Akello. Thanks so much for your work and support in the back. Thank you, everyone. We look much forward to your inputs to our final poll to cooperate with you more closely and to see you at our future stakeholder events. All the very best. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. See you again. Thank, see you. You. thank you. Thank you, you so thank you. Much. Good Have a good rest yeah, of the you. day. Thank good evening and good, good day. Evening. Okay, yeah. good evening. 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 Good evening.